sound. As they will interfere with the recording equipment, apologies. Any apologies? No. Um, just a few items under Chair's business. Um, the Minister has agreed to attend the committee meeting on the 1st of July at 2 o'clock to discuss the financial situation for 1516. Um, seek an agreement, members, as well, to write to the Department for updates on the review of the administrative structures within the health and social care system and the review of the commissioning process. Members in agreement? Great. Uh, just also want to refer to the recent call for an air ambulance service um, by the local medic, Dr John Hines. Again, this was an issue that was raised um, a number of occasions. I'm seeking agreement, members, on the back of the meeting yesterday to write to the Department for information on its position uh, in relation to air ambulance service, including details of any ministerial meetings that might have taken place recently to discuss. Are members in agreement with that? Agreed. Okay, item three, members, is the draft minutes of the meeting on the 10th of June, which are at page six of your pack. Are members content with the minutes? Chair, just before you go on, sure. yep. just to go back to the air ambulance. Yes. I, I mean, um, I certainly, from my point of view, welcome the proposal, but this has been on the agenda, I think, since this assembly reopened in, back in 1998. And we're at least we're glad that somebody is trying to push it forward in the interest of safety for Northern Ireland. Yes, and I, I think there were there were conversations taking place with um, the health minister in Leinster House as well previously around yeah. uh, an island-wide service. So I think it is appropriate that we would write back and get an update uh, on the current departmental Absolutely. position well done, uh, in yep. relation to it. Thank you for that. Uh, so the minutes are members content with the minutes. Great. Okay, <coughs> members. Item four is the <coughs> review of workforce planning. Um, the briefing today by the five trusts. Just to inform members that Claire Duffield from the Northern Trust will make the opening presentation to the committee. So we're just waiting until our guests arrive. And it's page ten, members of your pack. Okay, members, you're very, very welcome. Um, thank you for attending today. Uh, hopefully, I will get all your names correct. Claire Duffield, who is the HR Director of Northern Trust, and Claire, you, you will make the opening comments. Anne McConnell, who is the HR Director in the Western Trust. Uh, Damien McAllister, Director of HR and Organisational Development in the Belfast Trust. Kieran Donaghy, Director of HR and Organisational Development in the Southern Trust, and Eamon Malloy, Director of HR and Corporate Affairs in the South Eastern Trust. Um, so I'm going to invite yourselves to make the opening yeah. comments. Damien, yourself. I'm, okay. I'm going to start. Good afternoon, Chairperson and members of the committee, and thank you for giving us this opportunity to address you today as you continue to take evidence in respect of your review of workforce planning within the context of transforming your care. Before commencing our open statement, we'd just like to introduce yourselves formally to the committee. My name is Anne McConnell, and I'm the Director of HR for Western Trust. Good afternoon. Claire Duffield, Director of HR in the Northern Trust. Kieran Donaghy, Director of HR Southern Trust. Emma Malloy, Director of HR and Corporate Affairs, South Eastern. My name is Damien McAllister. I'm the Director of HR in the Belfast Trust. Our provision of oral evidence today to the committee is further to the written evidence each of our organisations provided to you, your ongoing review in mid-May of this year and the subsequent request to each of the HSC provider trust chief executives received on the 14th of May. Within this correspondence, the committee specifically asked that in our opening statement that the trust would provide evidence of the progress our trusts have made to date on workforce planning in support of the implementation of Transforming Your Care, to include details of the strategic direction your trust has been given by the Regional Workforce Planning Group, the Department and the HSC Board, investment made in retraining of staff to achieve appropriate skills mix and investment in leadership and capability development, how the money shifted from hospital-based settings to community-based settings under TYC, brackets £25 million a <coughs> date, has impacted on staff and how trusts have dealt with this, whether our trust has been asked by the Regional Workforce Planning Group or the Health and Social Care Board to do workforce planning to support a shift of services out of hospital settings into community and primary care settings, 
on how Trust's employers are taking account of recruitment issues for particular geographical areas, the desirability of seven-day working and the composition of workforce in terms of gender mix and the associated work patterns. We will address each of these issues in turn. In respect of the Regional Workforce Planning Group, each of our organisations is represented by a HR Director or Deputy Director, with at least four of those present here today being members of the group. As HSE Trusts, we fully support the establishment and operation of the Regional Workforce Planning Group, and we believe it has provided the necessary vehicle by which, firstly, the appropriate means of approaching workforce planning has been agreed, which will help us to achieve a, workplace, <coughs> a workforce of the right size, with the right skills, to work in the right place at the right time. Secondly, that we have secured, secured a workforce planning approach, which, while the patient and client centred, is flexible and responsive to change in service demands. And third and finally, facilitated workforce planning through appropriate training means that it can be based around programmes of care while determining the impacts on both single and multi-professional groups. We have, as provider organisations, all contributed to the development and agreement of the regional HSC, HSC workforce planning framework document which sets out in detail both the methodology to support workforce planning and the key roles and responsibilities of key parties in the process, including the Department of Health, the Health and Social Care Board, the Public Health Agency and ourselves as trusts. However, we would like to assure the Committee that while this document has only recently been agreed, we, as, we all as trusts have had prior involvement in workforce planning initiatives at the local level. In its most basic form, workforce planning is modelling the workforce to meet demand and while arguably not adequately resourced to do this, each trust through local managers have considered workforce needs, planning and determining how service demand can be met or how new services with the support of our local commissioning groups and the Health and Social Care Board can be delivered. The outworking of some of these initiatives have resulted in new service delivery models, an, exam an example of which we will each shortly provide from our organisations, retraining for some staff in new activities or the creation of new or merged <coughs> roles based on the concept of skill mix some of which have worked across traditional professional workforce groups. In terms of the latter, I would wish to highlight the development of the Allied Health Professional Support Worker in the community, which has allowed a merge role to be created to support professional Allied Health Professional staff carrying out home treatment plans. Previously, each Allied Health Professional grouping had their own support worker, but now one person works across physiotherapy, occupational therapy and speech and language therapy disciplines. We would also point to the development of advanced nurse practitioners within HSC emergency departments, which, while not fully replacing hard to fill middle grade medical posts, has allowed some of the shortfall to be addressed through extended nursing roles. Having specifically described our role as trust representatives on the Regional Workforce Planning Group, we felt it may be worth at this juncture, and by way of assistance, to also provide an overview of our role in workforce planning as trust directors of human resources. At a high level, and by way of example, our roles and accountabilities for workforce planning locally include the provision of workforce data and information for the organisation the provision of recruitment and selection processes and initiatives to meet workforce needs, supporting the development and delivery of directorate and service improvement working plans through HR business partnering, which respond to forecasts that workforce supply and demand and which are aligned to strategic direction, the development and delivery of a strategy for learning and development to meet current and future skills and capability requirements within the organisation. The Committee has also asked for information in respect to leadership and capability development, and there are a range of initiatives undertaken in this regard across each of our organisations. For example, the HSC Knowledge Exchange is an actual and online forum which provides opportunity for HSC employees to discuss, debate and address emerging issues within health and social care. It has provided access through the HSC Leadership Centre to a range of additional resources for HSC leaders, access to best practice from across the national and international markets. Regional and trust-led succession planning initiatives, which as a result of workforce planning, have analysed recruitment and turnover trends and determined that more needed to be done to grow future HSC leaders. We have also introduced formal coaching and mentoring strategies, which have assisted general and clinical leaders and managers to focus on performance and service delivery and productivity improvements. And we have also recently and trust-led leadership and management development programmes, which have aimed at developing senior and middle management health and social care staff to be able to practice and operate in a range of situational models, including both distributive and collective leadership, applying organisational development methodologies, including Lean, Six Sigma and IHI AAAM, and managing change programmes and their impact on both staff and patients alike. We will now turn, with your permission, to the specific examples of service change initiatives, which have resulted in new services being developed within the context of transforming your care. Um. 
I am going to concentrate on an example of outpatients reform that has been implemented in the Western Trust area, and my colleagues will give examples of other areas. It is important to note that outpatient reform is integral to reform of pathways for long-term conditions and acute care reform. The current process for outpatients, as you, as you are aware, is that the GP who sees and assesses the patient, um, the GP may or may not do investigations, and in some cases the G GP may not have access to all of the investigations that um, they, they would need without going through the hospitals. Um, the GP decides if specialist advice is needed and then makes a referral, either by letter or electronically, and then the patient attends outpatients. Um, and the average cost for that is um, £205 per outpatient appointment. The, um, the opportunity to reform requires GPs and consultants to change the referral patterns and behaviours and for referrals to be seen as requests for specialist advice. The change also requires the upskilling of the primary and community care staff to support the new models and ways of working. That is the workforce planning element of the service redesign. Western Trust is aiming um, to reduce outpatient attendances by 15 per cent in the West in 15 and 16 uh, this year. An example of this um, that is already underway is the respiratory care services. A workforce plan was developed and the HSCB local commissioning group provided the funding to support the transition to a new model of service. The multidisciplinary model comp uh, comprised a consultant, an oxygen specialist nurse, a respiratory pharmacist and a respiratory physiotherapist. The service was changed so that there was a consultant-led focus on the community. This involved outreach clinics being held, phone or virtual clinics, phone and email consultations, home oxygen assessment, drugs reviews and physiotherapy available at home. The outcome in one year is a 38 per cent reduction in the length of stay in the South West Acute Hospital for respiratory inpatients. 152 new referrals were contacted and 48 of those patients were discharged. Using phone and email consultations, 33 admissions were averted and 89 uh, review clinic appointments were uh, averted. The waiting time reduced by 10 months for oxygen assessment. And while all of that undoubtedly re um, reduced admissions, there has also been considerable savings on drugs. Five of the top six drugs prescribed in Western Trust are respiratory drugs. In uh, four months, there was a saving of approximately £70,000 and almost 100 admissions prevented through physiotherapy interventions. So from a performance perspective, this demonstrates real improvement, but more importantly, from the patient perspective, it demonstrates improvements in quality of care. Patients have reduced side effects from drugs, have interventions to avoid admission, are supported in a more timely fashion, and if admitted, have uh, shorter hospital stays. Hematology in the West has also transformed outpatient services using similar approaches, so this transformation in services can be re replicated in other service areas, and the work is underway in diabetes, cardiology, ENT and renal services. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to provide you with an example of how workforce planning has contributed to and supported the implementation of reablement services in the Northern Trust. The reablement ethos is a person-centred approach which promotes and maximises independence and it allows people to remain in their own home for as long as possible. The reablement service is a planned short-term intervention which provides support to a patient in their home. It's designed to enable people to gain or regain their confidence, ability and necessary skills to remain independent after having experienced a health or social care crisis such as an illness, a deterioration in health or perhaps an injury. The aim of the reablement service is to help people perform their usual daily living skills such as personal care, walking or preparing meals so that they can remain independent at their own home. The Northern Trust has developed a reablement service from within its existing home care resources. Anticipated demand was forecast from domiciliary care referrals <coughs> and package requirements. Initially, the services were established through a dual role approach. In other words, existing staff were trained for dual roles supported by the redeployment of hours within in-house domiciliary care. 
In the past year, the Trust has developed specific reablement teams in line with the regional model by redeploying individual staff from core services into specific reablement teams across the Trust. This has enabled a large percentage of new referrals to domiciliary care being referred and accepted instead through reablement. The service benefits also from the specialised focus provided by occupational therapists to maximise the overall effect to meet the individual's optimum level of independence. In the Trust, the service comprises approximately 92 whole-time equivalent domiciliary care reablement staff who are supported by around 10 occupational therapists. Both workforce groups have a mix of skill level aligned to referral needs and demands. But let me come to the workforce plan. The workforce plan to enable the development of this service included a comprehensive training programme for allied health professionals, occupational therapists, social workers and district nursing teams. The training was designed to address both skill and competency requirements and covered topics such as the values underpinning the service, reablement experiences, professional perspectives, person-centred planning, recording and reporting, and communication skills. <coughs> Most importantly, the staff training programme focused on developing behaviours and skills that would help make the shift and transition from an ethos of doing for to one of doing with. As previously described, the workforce plan also helped to identify the number of staff required and where these could be sourced from. From a workforce perspective, service change is also supported by a framework for the management of people change to ensure that employees affected are engaged and consulted with as appropriate. The Trust continues to develop and improve the service and plans to integrate this into its locality multidisciplinary teams in the future. Chair, if you're happy, I'll continue with an example from yep. Southern. <coughs> in July 2009, the Minister for Health approved proposals for the future revision of mental health and learning disability services. The implementation of this decision provides an example of how workforce planning works within Southern Trust. The changes were brought about through the Bamford Review, which required a fundamental shift as members know in the balance from hospital based to community settings. At, the at that particular time, <coughs> the Trust had 108 mental health and learning disability beds on the St Luke sites. 220 staff of various grades provided care to those patients. The current position is that all those staff have been redeployed apart from a small number who requested VER and all the patients have again been given into community settings. The only thing that's left on the St Luke sites is Gillis, which is an adventure ward. As the committee is aware, effective workforce planning can only be introduced when the model of service delivery has been developed and agreed through the Commissioner and the Department. For that reason, I will concentrate on three examples of new service delivery models that we agreed within Southern in order to allow that move from St Luke's to happen. Supported living, assessment and treatment and crisis response teams. In terms of supported living, the Southern Trust has now developed 13 homes in terms of supporting living within its area. The latest being Granville, which is a learned disability home within Dungana. Um, it provides for 25 tenants in five separate but connected houses. Each house has been assessed and the required staffing levels assigned according to the complexity of the patients, and each individual patient has been assessed according to their needs. Staffing is or 24 hour shift patterns, seven days a week. And within that particular home, 60 staff have been provided from St Luke's in order to provide that service, and each of those staff have undergone retraining. The next example is assessment and treatment unit relocated to Craven Area Hospital, site in the summer of 2014. The Trust recognised the need for continuing level of inpatient assessment and treatment and created the Dorsey unit within Craven Area Hospital in the Bluestone unit, which is 10 beds. Again, 25 staff now provide a service through that unit to the learned disability clients. The third example is the crisis and home support team. Again, there we have 30 staff within that area, but more recently within the learned disability, we've also created a crisis 
response and home treatment team, which is the first of its kind to that particular client group. And it provides services which are very effective to allow clients to remain in their own home and basically allow them to support the family and the carers. Many of the 120 staff that were formerly on the Sindlick site, of course, required retraining, and that retraining was given by the Trust. They have all now been redeployed into new areas of work, including the Bluestone Mental Health Unit, supported living homes, support and recovery teams, home treatment and crisis response teams, primary mental health care and community psychiatric liaison teams. But again, the Trust was mindful of its decision in terms of the St Luke site. And working in partnership, we actually redeployed and centralised our support functions onto the St Luke site, take account of the gap that we left in terms of moving those clinical services off. So again, we reprovided up to 200 jobs through the replacement of HR services, finance services, and some element of shared services. Thank you, Thank you Karen. Anyone? Chair, uh, one of our biggest issues facing the delivery of health and social care undoubtedly is a forecasted increased prevalence of dementia in our population. In Northern Ireland, as you're well aware, we have one of the fastest growing elderly populations in the UK. Currently, over a quarter of a million men and women are of pensionable age, which is nearly one in six of our population. By 2028, that will have increased by, to nearly one in five. I'll be joining the <coughs> ranks. By 2050, uh, almost one in four. Demographic changes have a specific impact on demand for health and social care services, and that's fairly obvious. As life expectancy increases, the, fir the number of people affected by conditions associated with old age will increase uh, commensurately. Based on rates from across Europe, we may see dementia numbers rise from 19,000 currently in our organisation or our trust population to around 60,000 by 2051. We must also remember that dementia does not only affect the elderly. There are a significant number of people who live with dementia who are under the age of 65. Uh, early onset dementia is especially difficult to diagnose, so the actual number is uncertain at present. However, estimates suggest that there could be as many as 1,000 people affected by early onset dementia in Northern Ireland. Considering the specific needs of this group is another challenge that must be tackled. I'd like to tell you a little bit about a specific approach which has been piloted in the Lisburn sector of our trust, uh, which, although small scale, has proven to be highly successful in meeting two of the stated objectives and recommendations of TYC, that is, changing care packages for people in the residential and nursing home sector, and more importantly, for our clients, avoiding unnecessary admission to acute hospitals. Traditionally, care homes sought assistance for residents who had dementia and are unmanageable challenging behaviours from already uh, overstretched GP network. GPs would often refer these cases straight on to acute psychiatry so as to cause no delay in the treatment plan for the organisation without uh, for the patient without full and, and proper assessment of, the, of any delirium or risk factors that they may be experiencing. This led to acute psychiatry receiving an increasing number of referrals and a poor response for the patient as waiting lists grew longer and larger. At one stage in the sector, whilst the waiting time target was nine weeks, in reality this was extending to waiting times in excess of four months. You can imagine this could only be, lead to an unsatisfactory, unsatisfactory outcome for the patient, safety of other patients becoming compromised, and un unacceptable levels of disturbance within the facility or home that they, they were living in. So with the help and expert assistance of a number of our staff, we sought to examine what we could do to respond to this, using TYC as the, as the linchpin. Our aims were to improve the treatment of delirium in patients with dementia living in our care homes, to reduce the number of referrals to acute psychiatry and admission of patients who have dementia being inappropriately admitted to the acute psychiatry unit, assist nursing and residential staff and general practice to become more aware of delirium and the impact that it can have on our patients, and reducing waiting list times. On examination, our CPN service came up with a simple solution of aligning themselves with each of our care homes in turn to provide the first response rather than the GP to the home in cases of delirium rather than the GP itself. They were willing to extend their role to undertake this range of functions and develop a new skill set in this service area. They developed a systematic checklist which standardised the approach of the CPN on examination of the patient. The Commissioner has now recognised that this solution works and has now allocated funding to support this initiative of an additional five new CPN posts in this sector only, a social worker and two part team part-time posts with a new title of Dementia Navigators, and essentially their job is to try and signpost people to particular services and specialties. The outcome of this simple service model is a marked reduction in waiting times for patients with dementia, 
exhibiting challenging behaviour from four months waiting on an acute psychiatric referral or appointment to one week within our new CPN aligned service. A marked reduction in straight referrals to the Department of Acute Psychiatry by 26 per cent. Care home staff have reported they now have been more confident and supported in dealing with delirium and challenging behaviours, and the CPNs have, cons have consolidated their knowledge and there is less chance of symptoms of delirium being missed in the treatment of our patients. As an offshoot, a byproduct of this last point about the CPNs consolidating knowledge, uh, they have now taken on responsibility for running nurse-led clinics in dealing with delirium and challenging behaviours. They act as liaison and triage points for the medical team. They now organise post-diagnostic support clinics. They are involved in anxiety management groups, and they are participating in a new and innovative wellbeing hub in the Dunmurray and Stewartstown area. So, in summary, we have now used the ideas of our current staff group to shape a new service model which is responsive to our, our patient needs. We have extended the existing role of the CPN, and this has provided us with a solution to service need which is likely to increase over the foreseeable future. Our next steps are to share the evaluated outcomes of this approach with other CPNs and to begin further alignment of these staff with all homes in our geographical area, and to encourage the homes to use the checklist independently to uh, identify and treat delirium at the earliest possible juncture. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for that. I the programme tr treatment unit was launched within the Belfast Trust during the 2010-11 financial year. Following receipt of comments from a patient who questioned the amount of downtime they experienced while waiting for specialist clinical treatment as an inpatient within the hepatology service in the hospital, who queried could much of this clinical treatment not be provided as an outpatient. The programme treatment unit by background falls under the traditional title of ambulatory care and offers care in the day by predominantly a nurse-led team who have been empowered to take the lead in pathway care. All nurses working within this area are educated to a level of practice to ensure that they are competent and safe in providing the specialised clinical treatments that are offered, and they are also supported by specialist nursing teams who work to the unit. Trust medical staff, who traditionally provided the specialist clinical treatment before the service was created, now offer a clinical advisory and support role to the unit, which in turn has freed them to concentrate on other more highly specialised tasks. <coughs> the nursing staff, in addition to being supported by other specialist nurses and medical staff in the hospital, also receive support from pharmacy and allied health professional staff, and the patient pathway is now such that all patients receive their treatment, be discharged and booked for follow-up appointments all in one visit. When launched as a trial, the service comprised of one nurse providing one specialist clinical treatment to 68 patients within a room off the main ward. While this was very much a very small launch of the service, it moved to demonstrate the concept, and quickly the service began to gain the confidence of the wider clinical team, to whom these 68 patients would have been otherwise admitted for the same care. Quickly, one nurse became two, and the number of clinical treatments grew that were being offered, so much so that by 2014-15, 6,800 patients were receiving 32 different clinical treatments in a larger but still relatively small location within the Royal Victoria Hospital, a unit comprising five day beds and five chairs from an enhanced team led by nursing. The results achieved have also been very significant. The average overall length of stay for patients within the hepatology service has fallen from 13 days in December 2011 to 10 days from December 2014, while the length of stay for liver transplant patients has reduced from 11 days in hospital before transplant surgery to actually now not requiring any. The service is now seeking to expand the range of clinical treatments it can offer and to provide more clinical treatments to support the flow of patients through the unscheduled care pathway within the Trust. Given the success gained to date in enhancing the safety and quality of the service provided and reducing the need for admissions and length of stay within the hepatology service, it is envisaged that with a larger footprint area to work from and with an increased nursing-led resource invested in the programme treatment unit, we could equally help improve patient outcomes and avoid some unnecessary admissions that may occur through the Trust Emergency Department. <coughs> the Trust is currently working with the Health and Social Care Board and Local Commissioning Group to seek the means of securing the resource that is needed to achieve this, recognising that in the first instance this will require some supported initial financial investment to help the bigger unit to be established before any projected savings can be realised. We hope that the examples we have offered provide reassurance to the Committee that workforce planning, often in its most simple form, is central to the development and delivery of services offered within all settings in health and social care. Turning very quickly now to the issues of our involvement in workforce planning led by the Regional Workforce Planning Group, the Health and Social Care Board and Public Health Agency. We are all currently participating in the Regional Health <coughs> Workforce Planning Group's approach in domiciliary care, 
and the various specialty, speciality medical workforce plans, which have been led by Dr. Carolyn Harper from the Public Health Agency on behalf of the Department. The Trust fully welcome both of these approaches, as while each takes account of the regional service delivery model principles that pertain, they are also sensitive to local and specific service needs. For example, the Workforce Planning Review of Domiciliary Care, which has been significantly influenced by the near-completed Health and Social Care Board-led review of domiciliary care service models, will provide, in our opinion, a regional overview of the workforce growth in numbers and the change in skills that are needed to meet the increased demand brought by the needs of an ageing population, but will take into account demographic issues that each of the five trusts individually face. The current challenges facing health and social care are significant. There is a growing demand across a wide range of services set in the context of reducing budgets. Specialities within the area of unscheduled care, for example, including emergency medicine, acute medical care and surgical services, are now being challenged to move to full service provision across seven days. Setting aside the very evident financial challenges the growth in demand invariably brings, it also obviously presents significant workforce challenges of their own, particularly in view of the current configuration and service delivery models that exist. Local service planning gives consideration to these workforce needs, and each trust has a range of posts mostly medical, for which ongoing recruitment difficulties are being experienced. A number of our trusts have sought to address these difficulties through international recruitment through agencies. However, this has had very limited success. The trusts, with the support of the Health and Social Care Board as commissioners, are therefore working collaboratively to explore a range of solutions, including the establishment of clinical networks, targeted recruitment internationally in countries and regions where there may be an oversupply of workforce, and the creation of extended roles such as physicians' assistants. Workforce planning plays a formal and informal role in how services are planned and delivered within health and social care in Northern Ireland, and it involves many managers, staff, trade unions, our patients and clients, and stakeholders in its processes. It can be both complex and straightforward, informed and informing how we commission services to meet population needs, informing and informed by how we commission university and educational places for our health and social care professions, and informing and informed by how we develop the roles and skills of our workforce. We are pleased that the topic of workforce planning is under consideration of the committee. At a time of such challenge, the Trusts appreciate the help this will, focus, will bring in support in the continued development of services and the implementation of patient-centred transforming your care initiatives <coughs> through employee and workforce transformation and change, particularly in constrained financial climates that we are operating in. We would like to again thank the committee for the opportunity to address you in this critical function and hope that this opening statement supports the written evidence that we have submitted as the provider organisations within health and social care. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for that, those opening comments. And I suppose we've heard we've heard much there about particular individual service delivery models, you know, from outpatients through to mental health um, reablement, a, a number of, of fronts. But we had heard from a number of, of um, professional organisations in our in inquiry and review um, that they were actually unaware of the workforce implications of transforming your care um, on their members effectively because the service delivery models hadn't been established um, hadn't been designed even and certainly hadn't been put in place so i suppose my question really is it who's responsible for that is is it, is it the board or is it joint responsibility from the board and the trusts I think we all are, Chair, to, to be honest with you. I mean, I think we, what we've tried to present is that you know, there are local service delivery models that we develop locally and then seek the support of the Commissioner to provide funding for. And then there are also regional service delivery models that are very much led by the Health and Social Care Board as a Commissioner and indeed influenced by the Department that we would be party to in terms of resolving the impacts that that might have on our workforce. So I think directly in answer to your question, it's both of us are responsible. So it's a joint responsibility. Joint responsibility yeah. Okay, so see, I suppose in relation to you know, if there's a responsibility also on the board, uh, you know, do you feel as trusts that you are anyway being hampered if those responsibilities aren't being actioned? I suppose. I can only speak for the Belfast Trust. I mean, maybe colleagues I want to speak on behalf of them, but I, I think we have a very healthy relationship with the Health and Social Care Board as a commissioner. Um, there's often cases that we put to them that they don't support as a commissioner. They don't see it within the, the overall service delivery model, and that's fine. But and I think that you know we were supported by them uh, and equally by the department. And I would bring back to the, the, the comments we made in the opening statement. I mean, we are very, very supportive of the regional workforce planning group and the principles that it established. While many of the principles we were probably 
uh, you know, displaying locally and actually putting them in place locally to now have them within the regional context of the regional workforce planning group and the, and the workforce planning framework document, I think only further enhances then the ability for the service to respond to population need. Okay, and I'm watching others shaking their head in agreement with it. You think it's a joint responsibility <coughs> and that there's a good good working relationship? I think, I think you know, each, each one of us have a, a particular role to play, Chair. The role of the, the Commissioner is, is important in terms of uh, assisting us to, to interpret strategic direction from the Department of Health, but their, their primary responsibility is to assess the need of the population and to specify and design services to, to meet that need. From our perspective, it's up to us to try and ensure that we put the, the proper staffing model in place to deliver that care. And that's where I, I think some of, and I, I take it from what you were saying earlier, that some of the representations you may have received when you mentioned the word members uh, from our trade unions and professional organisations may not necessarily see a direct link to TYC, but a lot of the workforce reform that we're actually involved in uh, is done in partnership with our trade unions. They're very aware of what we're doing. They're subscribe in the main to most of the things that we're actually trying to do and that is about trying to develop new roles new skill sets new ways of approaching some problems that previously were intractable so i think everyone's got a role to play in this and, and a simple example i was giving you was about asking our own staff because on occasions frontline staff have the best solutions to some of these problems because they're doing the job every day well what i would suggest um you know, and our, all our sectors can speak for themselves, but it was much more than a direct link. Uh -huh. um, it was all of the organisations who gave evidence felt indeed that they weren't participating in the process. Right. They weren't at the table, bar one. Um, but I mean, I, 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 to reinforce what Eamon has said, I mean, within the Belfast Trust, we very much take a partnership approach to service development and service delivery, and our trade unions locally are involved in it. Um, that may not necessarily mean at all times that trade unions regionally. Uh, would be intimately aware of what's going on within the, the, the local organisation, but our trade unions locally are very much involved in the process. I think that's potentially the answer to the question. That you know, a lot of our local trade unions are very deeply involved yeah. in some of those areas of service planning and development. Well, I, I, again, I'm talking about in terms of the regional workforce planning group, which is not right. necessarily your responsibility, but it's fair every say, sector yeah. requested actually that they be active participants in the process and felt as And that's an issue that's with the Department yeah. of Health at the minute. I think it's fair to say that at the moment uh, the trade unions are not at the table at the regional workforce planning group, but they have been invited to um, nominate a representative to the regional domiciliary care working group, which is where the, the workforce planning is actually taking place for reshaping that model. But as Damien said, that the issue about representation at the Regional Workforce Planning Group is with the department at the moment. Okay. Well, in terms of, and, and somebody had mentioned it, recruitment <coughs> issues and retention issues, um, you know, it can, can be an issue in, in rural areas, but I know it's also an issue, for example, in, in, in the Western Trust. And, and that's been acknowledged in, in the briefing paper that you have uh, given to us today. Uh, I mean, do you feel as trusts that, in relation to retention and recruitment, that the department could be doing more at a regional level? Uh, maybe I'll, because you mentioned the Western Trust, maybe I'll speak first. I mean, I think one of our biggest challenges is our medical workforce. Um, and um, we, the department are very aware of the um, issues that we have there. But we're working with the Health and Social Care Board and the department to try to resolve some of the issues that we have. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the, the challenge is that the, the difficulties that we're experiencing are at the moment and the solutions are, um, you know, are a little bit off in, in terms of the planning piece. Um, so being able to deliver all of the solutions we need right now means we're having to look at, at other things. So we're looking at our you know, cross-border college. Um, we met with the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland this week. We, we do some um, training uh, grades with them in the Southwest Acute Hospital. We're looking at can we put in um, you know, post-grad level um, doctors to uh, onto our rotas to fill some of the middle grades, and that would be a really welcome development. Um, so we are looking at, at you know, solutions, and I suppose the trust has to take some responsibility for trying to find some of the solutions, and that's what we're doing. Yeah. Well, okay, but I mean, equally, the, the example was given. There was a ten million pound 
cost last year for locums in the Western Trust alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I can uh, just provide some more um, maybe examples or thoughts on how we're looking at um, particularly the, the medical workforce shortages. Um, you know, first and foremost, as you've mentioned, we have to ensure you know, the continuation of services. So the short term fix um, is obviously through the use of agency and locum doctors in the absence of a pipeline of candidates coming through. Um, however, you know, there's an example where the Northern Trust and Western Trust have worked together and collaborated to look at how services are being delivered um, to take a more regional or geographical approach um, to address any shortages that, that exist. Um, we're also looking at attraction and recruitment strategies, and I think it was Damien who mentioned the fact that you know, we do try to be creative and look at other ways of attracting uh, candidates, whether that be through overseas recruitment or um, a different model. Um, uh, you know, and, and for example, um, you know, in emergency medicine, um, the example of where we're looking at using physicians' assistance um, to account for the short. Yeah, I, sorry, sorry, I mean, I absolutely understand that, and I know the work that a lot of the trusts are involved in. But specifically, well, does the department I, well, need to do more in relation to this issue? And, and following from that, Damien, if, yeah. if if you just uh, allow me to address this, in terms of issues like, for example, GP contracts, do the trusts have a view as to, you know, how those contracts are drawn up and how you could influence those contracts to ensure that doctors are retained here okay. or deliver their service here? Well, well, well Chair, in answer to the latter question, we don't employ general practitioners, yes, so we have yes, no view yes. uh, per se on GP contracts, but we would have view on the contracts for hospital consultants and for trainee grade doctors. And indeed, there were national negotiations that our department, sponsor department, were involved in. And we as trusts uh, did feel and joined in that process because the department organised regular briefing sessions. And indeed, much of the department's approach <coughs> on the policy of that was influenced by how we found things on the ground. You know, we were giving them the reality of the situation and, and highlighting things to them about how we needed to potentially incentivise uh, you know, productivity, for example. Um, but I would like to go back to the earlier question about I mean, do we feel supported by the department? I mean, the department's HR directors forum is, is where we engage on a monthly basis with the HR director from the department. And medical workforce shortages are, have been on the agenda nearly every meeting for the last six months. And so, I mean, we're, you know, the department are giving us a listening ear. We have ability sometimes within the terms and conditions to look at incentivisation. So, for example, you know, I can quote an example that we used some years ago where we had a real difficulty and a specialty within the Belfast Trust. and We brought forward a, a, a very highly specialised service, unique to only the Belfast Trust, but we brought forward a requirement for recruitment and attention premium. And a case was made to the department, which was ultimately approved by the Department of Finance and Personnel. And for a time-limited period, we were able to offer that premium to attract in the right people to the service and to retain them. And it actually then meant stability was brought to a service that was so unique that it was virtually going to stop having to be provided within the National Health Service. So, you know, the department do have uh, those abilities if we approach it. But I, as Anne has said, I think there's a certain amount of responsibilities in us. And I think the example that Claire gave about clinical networking, I, you know, the solutions are multifactorial. It's not simply all about money sometimes. I think we need to perhaps do better to package what we have in Northern Ireland um, with the educational facilities that we have through Queen's University to be able to offer research facilities. Um, so actually, sometimes it's not just to simply about adding more money to it, but actually being able to put together a better package to sell coming and working and living in Northern Ireland. Yeah, but in ter terms of that, and I, and I appreciate that detail, but I suppose, you know, do you have a view as to should there be a requirement, if, if, if possible, in terms of doctors, consultants, contracts, that they are required to work here in the North or in a particular trust, for example? Do I believe they should be? I suppose um, we've had that type of a contract before for um, clinical psychologists a number of years ago, um, and the difficulty is it's, it is quite hard to enforce. So um, having you know, these people haven't gone through specialist training. Um, if their life circumstances change, if they, you know, if they um, marry someone and that person through their job has to live in a different country, then it's very hard for any employer to say, well. You actually still need to stay here. It's, you know, legally, it's hard to enforce. So, um, so I suppose that would be my answer to that question. It, even if you had that condition, it may be hard to to make it stick. Okay. Okay. Um, there's a number of on this. Yes. Yes. Right, Chair, just to, and in reality, 
these individuals are now a very, very uh, highly sought after group of staff internationally. You know, we find in our rural hospitals extremely difficult to staff shifts in there. We've had to look at other models of service because they, you know, whilst we could put, you will work with us for the next two years in the contract. In reality, as Anne said, it's difficult to enforce, and we're competing with the bright lights of Sydney and Auckland and uh, the, the rest of the world. So they do want to get uh, out and about and around around the globe, and that's what they can do. Okay. There's a number of members that indicated. Rosie first. Good Carly, and thanks very much, all of you, for your presentations today. Um, the committee is interested in the uh, relationships between the board and the trust and the department. Um, can you tell us what, as you understand, it, what's the key difference between those roles in terms of workforce planning? I mean, I, I, I'd, I'd respond just initially by saying I think we have found it very helpful in the last number of months that through the regional workforce planning group. Um, a framework document has been created that helps outline the rules and responsibilities of each of the stakeholder groups that are represented there, um, and also you know, a clear <coughs> commitment by all of those groups to the workforce planning methodology that has been agreed. Um, so, th so that document does help um, provide some of that clarification. I think, Karen, maybe. Chair, I suppose that the rules have been fairly clearly set out. A document that I think has been submitted to the committee, and really the department itself sees itself responsible for setting the strategic direction, ensuring commitment to a level of workforce strategy to underpin the department's wider policy objectives. The HSA is really there to be the commissioner, and to assure the HS Trust and the pen practitioners have considered and identified the workforce needs for service delivery, through, for example, demand and capacity exercises. And Trust, as Eamon has pointed out earlier on, ensuring that we have the right people in the right place at the right time, trained to deliver the services to our patients and clients. I, I often describe it as almost a virtual circle. Virtual circle. You know, we're sitting in one part of it where we're delivering local services, and we might identify a local service need for which then we push that to the HSCB commissioner. They take a view on it. It may then ultimately end up with the department who may be required to commission more educational training places from the universities for nursing or for medicine or whatever. And then it comes back around to the trust in terms of if the funding is secured, the department fund to the board, and the board give us as a commission the money to implement the service. So it's, I see it quite as a circular relationship as opposed to a hierarchical one. But in reality, the relationship on occasions can be fraught. You know, it's not, it's not <laughs> all sweetness and light as you could possibly imagine. And when you're dealing with, with scarcity of resources, particularly in terms of money, uh, you're always going to compete with other priorities. And on possible. occasions, that does bring tension into that relationship. But that's only the reality of the situation, I think. Do you feel the model works? Well, I think, I think we alluded to this earlier on. It's really important that we actually keep close. That we, you know, the prize is trying to ensure that we use every pound that we spend in the most effective way possible, particularly in workforce. And I think, from our perspective, it's really important that we, we have a clear definition of the type of services that we're trying to create and using the ideas of our existing workforce and others to try and shape what those service models are. But, you know, workforce planning is not a black art by any stretch of the imagination. There's no real science to it. It's quite simple when it comes down to it. But I, I think some of the, the issues that we, we encounter on a day-to-day -day basis are primarily around mm -hmm. the competing uh, yearn for, for additional resource. But we know that that's not a, a bottomless pit of, of resource. Right, okay. Uh, can I ask about uh, the Belfast Trust and, and in the, the document? Um, there wasn't there wasn't very much reference to TYC per se, and uh, in terms of how uh, you're changing, the, you know, the way services are delivered, would that be driven by the board? Would you say, or would it be the trust taking its own initiative? I, again, I think there's a dual relationship there. I mean, I think that there's an awful lot going on on the ground within the trust. I mean, we have our own Transforming Your Care program board, where, where a lot of our service development initiatives are brought and governed within the TYC framework, uh, and we very much view a very strong relationship with the local commissioning group, which is our conduit then into the health and social care board. So, again, I don't think there's one size fits all. This I think there's very much a, a dual partnership relationship between ourselves, the LCG, and the health and social care board as to how services are being transformed. TYC, in so much as itself, provides that um, coverage or, or, or that umbrella for it by which it's all been taken forward, um, and, and certainly it gives us leverage and the secure through uh, IPT or sorry, 
uh, bids that we can make to the board for the development of new services come under the TYC banner. Um, but yeah, it's very much a, a, a partnership relationship between ourselves and the LCG and the board. Okay, can I just ask one yeah, more sure. question? Can I, can I ask just about one of the programmes that you, you talked about, the reablement programme? Um, can you just tell me a wee bit more? I mean, is that working successfully? You know, like it's up to six weeks, people have that support. And then beyond that, is it, does it just cut off? Um, well, I think the success factor, and I don't want to speak on behalf of colleagues that aren't here today from that area or that service, but um, the, the success is about it being integrated into broader teams, broader locality teams that have access to specialists and uh, clinical advice from across a whole range of professions, um, and that's something that is how the, that's something uh, the way that we're developing the model uh, at the moment. Yeah. So it needs assessed. I, 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 yeah, I suppose the issue. Sorry, um, okay. I could just add. I suppose for reablement within the southern, it, it is about giving people the confidence to stay and live at home. <coughs> As a result of that, we have actually seen at least 50%, you know, stop and get into residential home or into hospital beds because of it. Mm -hmm. and that's now just beginning to reap the dividends, but it does mm -hmm. take quite a considerable time. We've been implementing that for nearly two years, but now we're hopefully in the shoots of something coming up from that in terms of that. Yeah, I mean I think I think it's a really positive idea but my concern is that then it just merges into the normal domiciliary care and we have lots of issues being raised about that that it's inadequate. Well, that might be the case depending on what the individual clients needs are assessed as being. You know after the, the reablement process it may be that they're assessed as needing ongoing domiciliary care to live at home or it may be that there are other pathways they need to go down, but it just doesn't stop. I mean, we just don't walk away once three of them is completed and, and, and leave the plant. I mean, there will be a continuum of you, care provided. So you maintain that support? Yeah, there will be an element of care maintained, yeah. Sure. Right. And that's I, above and aboard what domiciliary care provides them? Well, again, it depends on what the individual clients' needs are assessed as being. It may be that they only require domiciliary care, you know, or it may be that there's actually needs over and above that that can be met in another way, but it's yeah. individually needs assessed. Yeah, my concern is just we're hearing it from the other angle where people are under threat, they're at risk of ending up in hospitals because the domiciliary car has been reduced and they're ending up in greater need because mm. of that. So it's it's the other end that you're you're dealing with, but this is the this is the aspect of it which I think would I think prevent people getting into hospital if primary, that was primary objective better. of the services to ensure that that, that very thing doesn't happen. Yeah. Okay. End up in hospital as a last. Yeah. Last resort. Okay. That's what we've got to avoid. Yeah, well, that's, that's what we're all trying to do. Absolutely, really, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Rosie. And Kieran, next. Thanks, Chair. Just to follow on from, from Rosie's concern, certainly this uh, committee has voiced its concern on the domiciliary care or lack of it over a, a long period. And I'm, I'm glad and delighted to hear that the enabling uh, programme is working. But um, at the back of that, uh, certainly the committee and my concern was over a, a long period of time was that the number of individuals, particularly elderly, lonely people um, entitled to community meals, for instance, was vastly reduced. Uh, and the reason given by the various trusts was because of the enabling um, uh, process that was going on. Are, are you all confident that um, that vast reduction, and you know what I'm talking about, in people um, entitled to community meals, um, it's, it's working? You know, those people, as Rosie said, those people are not being left behind. You know, you're trying to get the enabling thing. We're all supportive, yeah. but we do not want to make. Sure, we want to make sure there's nobody left behind in, in relation to getting a decent meal a day. I think, I think that's that's right, Karen, and, and I know we. You know, it's a very highly charged and contentious issue right across the, the yeah. province. Uh, certainly, I think what what we want to make sure is that that those services that still require to be maintained in, a, in an individual's home. Are maintained at the appropriate level to the appropriate set of needs that, that individual has. In respect of the byproduct of the supply of community meals, the biggest issue that's been drawn to our attention is the socialisation aspect. In fact, yeah. someone is calling, but that individual taking time to talk mm -hmm. to them, saying how they are, listening to you know mm -hmm. difficulties of the day, and we're trying to replace a number of those things by by targeted befriending services and looking at, at the, the way. We can we can best support an individual living at home, okay. and you know I think it's not about you know meals are fine for those individuals who need meals, mm -hmm. but by the same token I think there are specific issues about ensuring that the 
people's socialisation and, and human contact is maintained during the course of the day without necessity of a meals provider. Absolutely. Well, thanks for that, very much for that. Uh, in relation to your, your, your briefing papers and your contributions this afternoon, it's very welcome. Thank you very much for it. And I was encouraged by each of, from each of you the um, enthusiasm that you seem to be saying that you are making progress on what we're talking about, and that's to be very much welcomed and, and keep it up. Um, but as a constituent um, representative, again, apart from community meals, the, another one is waiting times to get into hospital or for treatment. <coughs> and I got a, I got a, um, a list of waiting times from, for instance, the Port of Ferry uh, Health Clinic, and it was, it was unbelievable. I think there was one had to no, wait 80 weeks for something in the hospital. That is not acceptable, surely. And I'm going to ask the Trust to deal with that separately after because I'm conscious that we're straying on the as important as an issue it is, but I want us to keep us on the workforce. Oh, yeah, I'm being told off now for uh, <laughs> not for making decisions. But anyway, you get my point? Yes. yes. Well, I don't think anybody on this side of the table would accept that that's a, a, a position that we would find acceptable to be in. Yeah. No, okay. Absolutely not. Th moving on by being guided by the Chair, workforce planning, uh, the group, and I think you, you yourself, Damien, uh, said you, you were supportive of it. But can you tell us, can you uh, give us a, an assessment of the progress that uh, has been made by the Regional Workforce Planning Group? I mean, you're supportive of it, but well, you know, uh, the progress. I, I, it's one of those things that progress will happen on an evolutionary basis. I mean, but I would say that, you know, come back to the statement we made, one of the things that I think has been the biggest progress is the regional agreement on what the approach should be to workforce planning at a regional level. Um, when you previously had five organisations perhaps doing their own thing in respect of workforce planning, which may in itself have been successful, the fact that we now have a reasonably agreed framework gives us a very, very clear direction of travel. And actually factoring it around um, programmes of care is very, very important as opposed to focusing on unique professional need. You know, there's absolutely no point in going away and doing, uh, for example, a social work workforce plan or a nursing workforce plan mm -hmm. for the provision of older people's services in the community. What you really need to do, first and foremost, is assess the demand for older people's services in the community and then subsequently look at the unique professional or indeed multi-professional requirements that fall out of that. So what is the, the consequences on the demand that we face for older people's services in the community? How do we best meet that? And actually to work outside of the traditional professional boundaries, that it doesn't need to necessarily always be about the recruitment of more nurses or the recruitment of more social workers, and actually really begin to look towards the development of new roles, such as we mentioned within the Allied Health Professional Support role. Yeah. You know, yeah. Real opportunity to, to, to modernise and innovate, as opposed to continuing to deliver the service in the traditional means that it's always been delivered. Right, okay. I was coming on. The Allied Health Professional Federation has stated that there seems to be an inconsistency in the trusts in how they are reviewing their workforce and how they are planning. They, that association stated that they were not aware of the workforce planning happening at trust level. What is your response to this? And is it a communication problem? I mean, that's what. Sorry, who were, did you say it was? The uh, Allied Health Professional Federation. And also, sorry, the Association of Social Workers. Um, Northern Ireland Association, right? Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah. Um, I must admit, I, uh, the second group I know, the first one's new on me. Uh, yeah. I mean, we, we, we deal locally with the Chartered Society of Physiotherapists, the Society of Radiographers, who are the rec recognised professional associations and, and trade unions for those allied health professions, and they pretty much are involved at a local level, um, you know, on a weekly, daily, monthly basis for, for, for how we approach the workforce in that regard. Northern Ireland Association of Social Workers, I know each trust is having discussions with them. I recently had a meeting with them myself. And we are now beginning to engage them as a Belfast Trust uh, in terms of our social work forum. Um, they have a very vested interest within it, and we agree that they have a good, key participation and contribution they can make, and we are engaging them in that regard. Right. Um, but certainly the, 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 the previous group will need to go on and see who they are and, and, and see how we engage them if, we're, if we need to. I think it might be another example of the, the regional not necessarily knowing what is happening at the local, local level. Uh, yeah. and, you know, I, I would say, and stress again, there is very, very high collaborative working yeah. between professional organisations at local level and trust level in terms of the, the, the whole issue that we are talking about now. At the regional People may not necessarily recognise that that's the case. Right. And finally, um, we maybe probably have touched on this. Do the trust believe that the make-up of the regional workforce planning group is right? For example, would it be better served if education providers or training bodies were represented on it? 
would it be enhance the professional bodies and trade unions? Represent, I think we spoke about this earlier. So there are there's, there are gaps that people are. What, what, what's your reaction to that? Uh, well, do you want me to answer that, Tim? Mm -hmm. I think I think our, our our regional trade union colleagues and I love them dearly, but I, I think they believe that there's something going on in the regional workforce planning group that actually isn't. Um, and we had this discussion with them, very frank, an open discussion with them over recent days. It's really important that they do engage yeah. with, with trusts at local level uh, in the highest possible way that they can, because it, you know, that's, that's where this happens in reality. So I think from, from our perspective, we've been saying to them, whilst a seat at the table would be nice, they may find after a period of time that it's not necessarily where they can make the biggest input and impact. Right. So, uh, and I think they've broadly accepted that as, as being the case. But frankly, um, I have absolutely no difficulty with, with them being at that table. I, I don't see any, any issues for them at all. It's just where best they can play a, an active yeah. role. Okay. And Thank they you. currently have a request with the department for yeah. right. membership. Okay. And wish you all the best and keep up, because nobody knows who's going to need your services tomorrow or the next day. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay. Thank you, Kieran, for that. And Alex, next. Um, yeah. um, I was interested in it was the Western Trust. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you were looking at doing different outpatient yeah. reductions, and you mentioned about respiratory conditions. Yeah. And you were looking at hematology. Yeah. Um, are all the trusts doing the exact same thing? I think there are four there are four pillars of reform, and mm -hmm. outpatients is one of well, them. So every yeah. trust is um, um, doing um, similar types of work. I suppose we we're we are, um, we're looking at uh, I mean particularly being driven by things like our medical um, workforce shortages uh, about working smarter where in those disciplines. So we prioritise the disciplines where we have. Um, for instance, we have less haematologists than we would like, so we have a haematologist, a lead um, consultant who's inspirational in maximising the, the, his input, um, and we've designed a service around him. But yes, everyone yeah. is, is doing that we type are. of work. Next question. The Northern Trust paper states that they would like a greater leverage on the workforce planning in areas such as pharmacy and primary care. What, what do you mean by that? Well, I think, um, as we've described already, um, it's about the opportunity to work in collaboration with um, all the different stakeholders that impact our workforce or the pathway of care for a patient. Um, so whether uh, that patient is accessing services initially through uh, their GP or coming to um, the emergency department, um, it needs to be a clear and a journey for that individual depending on their requirements and um, that has an impact on you know the workforce and the skills and the capabilities of the workforce and also the, the required change in culture so that people are working outside of potentially you know silos and in particular directorates or areas so that there is more of an integrated approach to care for the individual um, and that therefore demands and requires that we uh, you know we work across boundaries um, and I think hopefully that you know describes a little bit what we were referring to so it's across boundaries whether that's acute care care in the community primary care um, and, uh, and building our relationships. Um, we do have integrated care partnerships, you'll be aware, and that is one way that we build those relationships um, and hopefully build the <coughs> ways of working within our community uh, workforce so that we do have locality-based teams that work in partnership with uh, GPs. So I know you're, you're all working together and got all these things to try and improve that and build relationships and all the rest of it. So would, would you say that the likes of pharmacies and different things, that's sort of holding news back a wee bit because they're not all part of it? But you have, obviously you're building the relationships, but they're not part of it. Is that sort of holding news back a wee bit and developing? Um. I'm not sure I'm equipped to comment on that specifically, but in the spirit of workforce planning, I think if there is any um, weakness in, in the cycle that affects the patient's journey, then that would, you know, that would hold us back. It's a community pharmacy, your, your, yeah. our, our hospital-based pharmacy, community pharmacy. Um, I don't think that would... 
Okay, just my last question. Is the lack of finance for transforming your care, the fact that you haven't progressed, is that holding you back quite a bit, that you're not able to progress things as quickly as you want? Workforce planning? Yeah. Well, we haven't been funded for, for workforce planning. Um, you know, any, any workforce plan that we're doing, we're probably doing within our own resources uh, locally. Um, of course, if we if there was funding available and it was invested in workforce planning to support local managers, then yes, it would be very welcome. And would that speed things up for you? Uh, well, I think Sir Liam Donaldson made particular reference to uh, transforming your care, and, and, and I think certainly commentary he had received indicated that there was a, a frustration that maybe how to progress in that regard. Certainly, uh, I think the responses that have went back to the, the minister on that would maybe indicate that it could be given a bit of impetus with some uh, resources. So, yeah, we welcome okay. it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pam. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentations. Um, in relation to um, mental health and learning disability resettlement, and I know, Karen, you had mentioned from the Southern Trust point of view, and you've probably answered most of my questions, but I'll ask again and maybe ask each of you to answer the same question. Um, what has this meant for each of the trusts in terms of the staff who previously were based in the hospital settings, and did they follow the clients to the new community settings, or were they um, redeployed to other areas? Could I start perhaps, and then my colleague could come in again? Certainly, in the model that we chose, we had one to one meetings with all our staff to try and obtain the options that where they wanted to go. Some of that was to follow the clients, for instance, supported living. We have quite a number of our staff who followed the clients within the supported living, which required a great deal of, of retraining. Others, however, chose to go to work in Bluestone, which is a mental health facility, in terms of the work that they wish to do. Home crisis response in the community was again an option that some of the other ones decided to go to. Out of 220 staff, we had 14 who took voluntary early retirement. All the rest were redeployed within the trust into various roles, not just within mental health, but within the other programmes of care within the trust. And that was again done with the you know, agreement of our trade union colleagues, particularly Unison and Nipsa, who were very, very useful and very helpful in that whole process. Thank okay. <coughs> you. I would say probably almost 100 per cent of ours have all followed the patient. Thinking specifically in recent times of the uh, closure of some of the wards in Downshire Hospital and replacement like Cedar, Cedar Court, and you know um, all of the staff have moved with them. I think that's really important, particularly in the area of mental health and learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. so that, you know that that relationship that's built up between the, the clinician and the and the patient is maintained. And was retraining required for the uh, when it was it was done. You know, uh, but you know, these are these are very well skilled and highly skilled individuals, and you know, very adaptable and flexible. That would be exactly the same story for us. Um, I mean, we're obviously moving people out of traditional institutions that they were cared for within, and we're resettling them both in sheltered accommodation and, and supported living, and then looking at home treatment teams. Um, no staff have been made redundant. All staff have been redeployed. You know, I would say, like Eamon, nearly 100% have followed. They've all stayed probably within their specialty area. Whether they followed the maybe the individual patients they cared for might be another thing. But in terms of staying within their their, their traditional professional area, yeah, they've stayed there. And again, they and again, were, were, were reskilling has been required. But I must say, very little of it has been because yep. you know it's 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 more about where they're cared for. You know, once it was a, an acute inpatient bed. Next thing, it's at home. The actual care, there's little difference between it in that regard. I'm not really going to say anything very different. Um, any of the redeployments that we've been involved in, um, there's a core group that go with the clients. Some individuals may choose that they want to stay in a hospital-based setting, and like Damien said, um, they are qualified to work in different settings, and it's more about changing the ethos of the care than actually having a lot of um, intensive retraining. Okay, and Kieran, it was on this, yeah. Yeah, just, just, just. I think you, Damon, the, the Muckamore set up. How, how is that progressing? We, we, you know, it's due for closure, or we're at least emptying very shortly. Well, yeah, the, the, the traditional institutions within yeah. within are emptying, but I mean, there are other services now being provided on the Muckamore site, which are, are fantastic and are you know really leading edge and, and first class. Um, we're, we're progressing very well, particularly with the resettlement from learning uh, disability. Right. So we're doing very, very well in that regard. But again, we have a wee bit more to go. But we're, we're working in partnership with um, uh, families 
um, so that you know nobody feels as though they're they're being forced out of the institution. You know, in that regard, we're very much working on partnership with them to make this as seamless as we can for the client. Good. Okay. That's okay. And uh, thank you, Kieran. And sorry, 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 sorry I to come back. It was just because I wanted to get to the Northern Trust as well, but uh, it was on the back of the Muckamore issue as well. I know there have been uh, issues in the community. Are there? Are you working? Um, with the community, I know you don't have to, but I also know the community, as in nearby residents and stuff, can be an issue and can have um, real concerns about who's moving in yeah. near them and around them. I know that's a huge issue, well, certainly in, in parts of Southampton, where, where the resettlement is is um, planned for. Yeah. Well, I can't comment specifically now on, 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 on the South Andrew situation or in respect of more, but I mean, in terms of our approach as an organisation, we would very much be in fulfilment of our personal and public in, in involvement, uh, our PPI scheme. We would engage the population that live in those geographical areas as part of any consultation exercise around changes in service delivery model, that it just wouldn't happen uh, without community involvement. Um, and while I can't comment specifically on that case, I would be surprised if it hasn't happened in respect of how we have approached it with the Belfast Trust and Mockmore. Give Claire, maybe not yeah, to. Uh, probably not um, a, a great deal to add to what's already been said, but um, in the Northern Trust, as you know, there has been a programme of resettlement mm -hmm. of patients from the Hollywell Hospital mm -hmm. into community living services. Um, from a workforce perspective, that's been about um, managing that change in line with our um, engagement and consultation framework for employees, uh, retraining employees uh, with <coughs> the right appropriate skills, but also um, through individual meetings with them, finding out where their skills are best placed. And, and there may be different individual decisions depending on that employee. Um, obviously, a, a large percentage being redeployed and following the patient, as per the examples that my colleagues have given. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Pam. Joanne. Thank you, Chair. Uh, can I also thank you for your briefing? Um, it's good to see Kieran here. I usually torture you with emails on a regular basis. Um, now that we hear that there are plans to resume permanent admissions to statutory homes and a reversal of the Trust's previous decision, thank goodness common sense has prevailed in that one. Can I ask then whose responsibility is it to provide adequate staff to cover these homes? Because Given the trust's reliance on private sector for domiciliary care and nursing home placements, who is responsible for providing an adequate workforce to staff these issues? Certainly, Chair, if I could comment first. And then, well, we work very closely with our service directors, and again, that in this particular instance, been been involved in it for the last two years, as you know, Joanne, and basically, um, we are very comfortable that we are able to provide the level and the service to those particular residents. As you know, the decision is that as long as a resident wishes to stay in their home, that will be facilitated. And we're very comfortable that we'll be able to meet those service needs and demands. With regard to um, the reversal of the trust previous position going forward um, with, uh, with, with certain homes and the reliance on the private sector, you know, whose responsibility is providing is that yourselves then for, for providing that adequate workforce given the, the reliance there has been on the private sector? I think if I understand your question we would look towards the service director to identify any gaps that are there and then this we will support yeah. and support the service director in delivering that service. Whatever sector to be the, while it be private or, or yeah. otherwise. I mean if it's a trust that's a tree residential home, it's our responsibility as the okay. employer to staff it. Okay. And the domiciliary care then too. Okay. Um, so that's something that the regional workforce planning group is considering then going forward, given the fact that the homes and that's something that you you, yep. you would be responsible for. Okay. Um, can I ask then what impact does the gender mix of the workforce in terms of working patterns have in trust workforce modelling? I think females part time. I think it's, yeah, I mean, I think it's fair answer. to say, yeah, <laughs> um, a female who works full time. Uh, but anyway, um, I think that the um, reality is that um, there are lots of um, staff choosing to um, avail of the flexible working options. Um, that is an issue for workforce planning. It is part of the um, mm -hmm. the challenges that we're finding with the medical workforce is that the, ch the change in the gender um, group coming through that. Um, so. I suppose as lifestyle ch um, trends change, 
we learn more and more about how people are, are working and we try to do what is called scenario planning about what are people likely to want in the future. Is that initiative to encourage you know, what more women suppose into back to work or um, well, we, we have we, I mean, we have things like back to um, to nursing courses and so on. So we we don't ever close the door on people that are are keen to uh, work with us. Um, so we try to have routes to re retrain people if they've taken um, a break or if they're having an employment break for a few years. We try to offer them refresher days or training days, the same with extended maternity periods and so on like that. They can come in and, and keep in touch dates. So that we don't, you know, that we continue to engage with them, continue to keep them. Given part the, of the pressures group. that staff are under, anyway, you know, um, holistically, and um, how, how do you then work with them to encourage that when very valuable members of staff feel under pressure? That um, we heard, we had a, an excellent um, presentation from Scotland how they have initiatives to, you know, to work around particularly women. To keep them in their careers as well, and to help with the workforce planning. So, you know, together, our trusts or individual schemes, or how how do you? Well, plan? We all, I think we all do have our, our own internal engagement um, process. Yeah. Do you want to say? This? Well, I, I could just pr maybe provide a, a bit more of an example or one specific thing in relation to the question that's being asked. Um, in the Northern Trust, as an example, um, you know there is obviously a much higher. <laughs> Um, percentage of female employees uh, to male, um, and you know, at, at the end of the day, however, we have to recognise that the changing uh, demographics of the workforce in general is that people are wanting much more flexible working arrangements. Um, they've got different lifestyle choices, and we have to have working policies and procedures that can accommodate in that can accommodate that, um, so that people um, uh, enjoy coming to work, and uh, while also not um, disrupting the continuity of the care and services that we provide. At a very basic level, that, that comes down to great uh, rota roster management, you know, at, at ward or service level. Um, at, a, at a more uh, corporate level, um, we would provide a lot of workforce information and analysis to look at the trends and patterns in the workforce. That would be For example, if people are leaving, then why they're leaving, and what could have been exactly. done. Exactly. So labour turnover. Uh, we know that. For example, there's approximately 3% of uh, the female uh, working uh, workforce in the Northern Trust who are on maternity leave at any one time, but by knowing that, we can plan for it. Um, so it's using workforce information and anal analytics to allow us to plan on a very local level, but also on a more strategic and corporate level. Because I note you talk about hard to fill positions. Yeah. But, you know, have you any indication of? Which you find the hardest to fill? Could you maybe outline those and what you're doing to address that? Well, we have a, a number of medical posts, probably common to all five yep. provider trusts that are hard to fill. Um, for example, consultants in emergency medicine, um, uh, consultant surgeons, um, and particularly with, with specialisation now, you know, the, 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 it's no longer just a general surgeon you're looking at, it's maybe a, you know, a breast surgeon or a gastroenterologist, uh, radiology. Um, Urology. You know, urology, as uh, so, uh, dermatology. I mean, you, you can almost name all the specialties. But I mean, from our perspective, you know, some of those are actually uh, national shortages that are across the, uh, the entirety of the United Kingdom. So that's why predominantly we're having to push the, the boundaries of where we traditionally look for supply to beyond uh, these shores to begin to look internationally. Uh, I mean, recently in the Belfast Trust, we advertised for consultants in emergency medicine, and we ran specific campaigns in Australia. Because we knew from people who had returned to work in the organisation, having spent two years in Australia, that there were a number of Indigenous Irish people there who could come back potentially. Uh, we didn't have great success, but actually testing the boundaries of it at least gives us more evidence that in the eventuality that we ever do need to engage the department in a conversation about a hard to fill post, at least we can demonstrate that we have tried, uh, you know, significantly to, you know, recruit and have been unsuccessful. Yes, well, tiny wee. Sure, yeah. um, I just noted, Anne, you talked about um, different methods you were using in the Western Trust and changes you were making in um, regard to outpatients as well. And you mentioned work underway in renal services. Yeah. You know, my particular interest in uh, renal services. Can you maybe outline I'm, what I'm you're I'm not doing? aware of your particular interest, sorry, okay. but um, okay. it's about more home dialysis um, and about um, skilling up community nurses to support people at home so that there's less need for them to attend outpatients or day um, clinics. 
So that's what the, the is that something's going to be rolled out across but the it, trusts? Yeah. 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 Given more significance, given the fact of more people needing dialysis as well, you're trying to push more the home dialysis route. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Joanne, thank you. And Michael. Okay, uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, folks, uh, for the presentation. What interests me is actually uh, time frames and resources available. Uh, shift left into transforming your care and uh, Kieran you gave us a good example in the Southern Trust of uh, mental health and learning disability through supported living and crisis and home support and crisis response and Eamon you gave us an example again in the South Eastern Trust through dementia uh, and those are good examples and uh, showing good progress. Uh, the issue for me therefore is across how many ranges uh, are you making that sort of progress? You have other areas, obviously, like stroke services or domiciliary care or uh, uh, respiratory or whatever. How many others are actually in place and making that sort of progress? Uh, what sort of... Uh, uh, because you have, first of all, you have the service delivery model, then you match the workforce, then you match the resource, then you match the time frame. And you appear to have done that uh, in those two examples in the Southern Trust and the South Eastern Trust. Where are you across the further range of, of uh, uh, service deliveries? And where are the other trusts in this? And are they matching you? What we don't want is good service delivery. You want good service delivery in your trust, but the Belfast Trust nowhere. For example, so it's to make sure you're getting that coordination as well, and then it's also the financial implications because Damien sort of hedged a wee bit about uh, uh, Liam and his report and money. But you need money to make this work. If you're going to move services into a primary community to dampen demand on secondary, uh, there's a serious financial implication for all of that. So it's, it's where are you with that, as far as Yes, you have a good story to tell there, and the two examples were. I take it, Kieran, you're one of the Donaghy gang, are you? <laughs> Sean and Colin. Fortunately. Well, then, if you're, if you're Colin's brother, I'm quite sure uh, you can be sure I'll believe every word you tell me. Absolutely. <laughs> How do you answer that? Um, Kieran. I, th I think we've. we've you know, the, the examples that we picked today was, were really to give you a, a blend of the services. We're all doing similar things. You know, we're all looking at, yeah. at reablement. We're all looking at how we run our outpatients clinics. We're all looking at various bits and pieces, and we learn from one another. So, if, if there's a unique uh, response or um, service model design going on in a particular organisation, we share that information so that we're not reinventing the wheel. I think that's just sensible to do. Um, you said how many more? The list is endless, Mr. Majemsi. Really, when it comes down to it, I think it, at, as we currently sit here, certainly within our organisation, we have 20. Bids, IPTs, currently under consideration between ourselves and the board. The prioritisation is going to be obviously an important aspect of that, but each one of them have, have merit in their own right. Um, and I think when those 20 are complete, if they ever are, I'll probably never see them in my lifetime, there'll be another 20 more to replace them. Um, and I think this, this is really, you know, the, the environment within which we work is so dynamic that, that it is important that, that we're always trying to use our resources in the best possible way. That's that's where we as HR folk come to our fore. It's really about trying to ensure that we use our resources in the best possible way, aligned to the patient need. Um, but specifically, I think we have all examples of what we've given today happening in each one of the organisations, and I think we'll probably have another 20 more if you want. To. What you're but saying in, in terms of uh, your example, uh, in terms of dementia, that's just one example. You could yep. give me many, many more. Yeah. Yep. The, the reason why I use that example specifically is because the, the suggestions came from the staff group themselves. We we were we were looking at this on the basis of we need you know potentially a new a new type of service, the CPM workforce, and uh, you know they're they're a quiet lot normally, but they were the, they were the individuals that came through and said, well you know we'd be willing to take that on. We know that you're we are referring these people directly to. GPs directly, you know, we, we can help in respect of that. Chair, Mr. McGinty, if I can give another example within the Southern Trust that I think is common. fairly common within all the trusts, and that's what we describe now as acute care at home. And basically, that is where we are trying to prevent 
some of the older, other population get into acute beds. And what we've done is actually set up um, an acute care team that basically now actually provides cover for 36 nursing homes, which is 1,500 beds and 21 GP practices. And what they do is they go in and look at the, the client in the community setting and provide a, a plan in order to look after their needs. And it's a, headed up by a consultant geriatrician with a number of other um, very professional staff. We basically go in and meet those needs of those clients on an ongoing basis, and that takes pressure off the acute system and allows those people to be looked after in their own home, which again is a good example of where we've went with TYC. But again, that is common to each of my colleagues. Yeah, uh, so therefore, this is not ad hoc, there is a plan. Well, absolutely. I, mean, I think we... what we want to see is the plan. We want to see the plan, we want to see the time frame. Uh, and we want to see uh, benchmarked against uh, workforce and benchmarked against finances. Can you supply us with that? I think the, I think there will be a plan. There will be a plan. There will be a plan. <laughs> there will be a plan. To be honest well, with you, there will be a plan. Uh, Kieran mentioned his uh, his example dating back to two thousand and nine. So it's. Uh, uh, that, that was way before TYC. So it's just, you know, we're not sceptical at all. No. But I believe firmly that unless you have the money, you can't do it. So therefore, that's why we need to see the plan. We need to see what, uh, 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 what you want to do, benchmark against workforce and money, and then we work out what the resource, what is it you want to do, and then what's the resource, how do you, you will, do it? You will know this better, better than me, Mr. HMC, that the important thing for us is that we have clarity about the commissioning direction of, of, yeah. of the service. We have clarity in respect of that. That is about us trying to translate that into what the workforce component is. Yeah. And that, that's, that's really where we take our lead from. Does strategy work, of the department. Does it work better then if all of you are going together? Precisely. All of you want to do mental health and learning disability, yep. all want, want to produce this together. And the, the, issue in the, past, the issue in the past, as Damien alluded to earlier on, was workforce planning was seen in professional lines, right down uni professional lines. What we're trying to do now is to ensure that that doesn't happen because all professions have, a, have a, a part to play in respect of this. And we're trying to do this on the basis of what does the service tell us we need? Mm -hmm. What do our patients need? And what professionals and individuals can supply and that what's in? the demand you're seeing? Much more what's the demand you're seeing for the future and how are you going to address that demand? Yeah. Exactly. But you have a long way to go. We have. Absolutely. But, but to be very clear, I mean, workforce planning you know, is not the solution. It's a vehicle by which we could arrive at the solution. The solution probably is driven by commissioning. Because the commission it is that meets population and needs. The local commissioning group determining what's the need and informing the board accordingly. Yeah. Workforce plan and drops out of that. A, there's, there appears to be a break there, as far as I can see. But anyway, that's that's the theory. Yeah. And then the board commissions and you provide. Yeah. We provide. Uh huh. Yeah. Can I also say, just as, as a comment, uh, as far as the regional workforce planning group is concerned, I think it's a serious mistake not to be including staff side. I think that's a major blunder. Uh, and I don't buy entirely the line that uh, regional and local are not talking and there's a dysfunction there. Uh, uh, and I think that if you're talking to unions, or whether it's union or unison or whatever, they know exactly what's going on. And I think it's being instead of, and I'm sure it's not meant to, and it's not your decision anyhow, but uh, they, you, you just got to go along to this. But it sounds like we're the bosses. We'll tell you what to do. You folks will do it. And I think that's this is a team game. We're all on the one team. So, well, I'd just like to reassure you that I mean, uh, we were not intent in any slight whatsoever in our regional trade union colleagues when we made our comments earlier about local trade union officials. We're dealing very much on the ground with our trade union colleagues and delivering in partnership the services that we provide. And we accept the position that there is regionally with the absence of the trade union colleagues on the regional workforce planning group. But as my colleague Anne alluded to. They have been invited to sit on the domiciliary care regional workforce planning group that we have, and I know they're actively considering who can take that seat or so up, because uh, it's very, very important. We're very much uh, in the world of partnership working with trade unions. Yep. Absolutely no question about that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael. And uh, Fergal? Thank you. Uh, we're a bit sceptical from time to time, uh, as you probably are aware. Um, can I just follow up on some of what Michael's been saying? And, uh, you know, if you're following a plan, how come there's such a disparity between your written contributions to us here today? Can you give me an example of, of what the... What do you mean by the disparity? Well, for example, your 
paper is 15 pages long, mm-hmm. um, refers to TYC once, I understand. The, uh, uh, the South Eastern Trust is about a page and a half. So in content alone, there's a huge difference between what is presented here today and is that consistent with the plan? Well, each individually as employers, we all have our own plan. I mean, the, I reflected the plan that we have locally within the Belfast Trust. I obviously can't speak for others. I mean, you make the comment that we only mentioned TYC once. Um, you know, we've had a service reform plan that's been required since 2008 when the first comprehensive spending review was put in place against the Trust. And we've been doing that plan for the last seven years. And when Transforming Your Care came along, it, it, it brought the plan together regionally uh, and gave us a very strong direction. We would contend that we were on that path, but it certainly gave us very clear and credible uh, evidence of where we needed to be. But I mean, my response to the committee was uh, in an attempt to be as full and frank as possible. Oh, oh yes. So is the South Eastern Trust then operating to a different agenda? That it's no, much, not at all. much more bold? Not no. at all. I, I tend not to write long letters, unfortunately. I do. <laughs> uh, but I think from our perspective, you know, as we've already demonstrated this afternoon, we have a, a broad canvas. We work across that canvas. We have similar ideas and plans in terms of what we we're trying to do in terms of putting services in place. Can, can you point to me the plan? Mr Majimsey was asking for. Where is the plan? Where are time skills? Well, the, the, the work that's ongoing in respect of the Regional Workforce Planning Group is to develop that plan. I think it's important that that, that, that group is given the opportunity to, to do just that, to bring it forward. And the, the way that we have described. What time skills are you operating to? Well, I, I, to be personally frank, I think that question is probably best addressed to the department. They're leading the Re- regional workforce planning group. But I think, from our perspective, we have we have a, an idea of what we would like to do within our organisation. We follow the commissioning direction. We try and put in place the services that we believe our patients and clients need. Now, if, th- if that's a plan, that's that's a plan. But. Yeah. If you're, if you're looking at something which is more uh, overarching and structured across all organisations, I think that will, that will come sooner rather than later, hopefully. But we're four years into this process, which was supposed to be a five-year process. Are you reflecting that back up? But to be, just to reassure the committee, we haven't in the last four years been doing nothing. We have been very, very busy in reforming our services locally, but I accept the point that when it comes to the Regional Workforce Planning Group and the Regional Workforce Planning Framework document that was only agreed in March, yes, they have only been agreed recently and they have only been established recently. Now is the time to put significant impetus and energy behind them, and certainly the work that we are doing on domiciliary care, which is complemented, as I have mentioned in our opening statement, the, the, the Health and Social Care Board's review of domiciliary care and the service delivery model is the first attempt at that, and we are very, very clear that it needs to have significant energy and commitment behind it, and we are all as organisations committed to it, because we recognise that that is a fundamental part of the service we provide, particularly to our older population, and therefore it has to be provided right. Yeah, I mean, just recently, Judy Thompson told us that it was now an eight to ten year plan. Has that been reflected to you? An eight to ten year plan in respect to what? Sorry, TYC. Mr. Kenny, I'm not TYC. TYC. Yeah. I mean, we locally all have our own TYC program boards, and we each have our plan that we're working to. I mean, you know, well, our plan. Our, 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 I'm trying to work out to what plan are you operating, what timescales are you operating to. Are there any timescales? Well, I certainly haven't. I can't personally comment that I have seen an eight to ten year plan coming down, but that's not to say one doesn't exist. But are you operating to the original five year plan then? We are operating locally, uh, and we operate within our trust delivery plan, which is an annual document which reflects all that we undertake right, to do no, as an organisation. I get, I get that, but in terms of the Transforming Your Care initiative, I'm just trying to work out yeah. where it's at now, yeah. to be honest. So it was a five-year plan. Uh, we're being told here it could be an eight- to ten-year plan. What is being communicated to you about that? Well, we just understand TYC to be an iterative plan. And I mean, I, I was here on the 11th of March with Heather Stevens in the department when we talked about TYC. And you know, TYC when it was launched in 2011, yes, fine, it was a document that was put a stake on the ground. It established a direction of travel. However, as we reflected that day, the service has developed and grew as well. And it not only has been about shifting things left. For, for example, when you look at yes, there has been a growth in our community staff, but there's equally been a growth in the, those staff working within the acute hospital service because service demand and service developments have occurred within that front. 
Um, so I, I think it is a rolling plan. I, you know, I don't think it's one of those that you simply just put time frames to it and work to, because I think it just needs to be sensitive to the fact as to how services are commissioned and how population need and health and wellbeing changes. Um, it is a stake in the ground, but it has to be something that evolves. It just doesn't, you know, just set down one direction of travel. Yes, but that's okay saying that now in 2015. That wasn't what was being said in 2011, and what people bought into in terms of uh, the executive's uh, uh, um, consideration of the business case. Well, I think it set down very clear principles that everybody would accept that it was about providing care insofar as possible in people's home, and that still is the aspiration of each of the organisations in health and social care. You know, we, we only want people in hospital when they need to be, yeah, and for as long as we can keep people out of hospital and out of institutions, that has to be a good thing, and that's all that we're working to. Yeah. How, how much of the cuts that you've been asked to uh, see through in the last while uh, impacted negatively on the plan, if it exists? Because I think the efficiency savings we've been required to make have been challenging. Um, I don't necessarily believe they've cut into any plan that we have. Um, indeed, they can be used as a, 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 a force for good in, in terms of you know, the, expediting the, the plan. The defence, the defence at other levels has been, yes, we accept this is counter-strategic. Do you accept that? You've been forced into counter-strategic measures. I think we try to avoid that yeah. where possible. But you know, in, in reality, and you know, we, this is well documented. The financial situation that we are working in at the minute is difficult, extremely difficult. It's as difficult as I've ever seen. And I've been around these parts for a long time, uh, but it has been very challenging over the last three to four years. And there is the potential for us to do things that are counter-strategic. But I think what we want to try and ensure is that we do things that, that, that are strategically sound and relevant. Would you accept that some of that counter-strategic approach has impacted on, on older people more than in some other areas? No. Given the cutbacks in domiciliary care packages? No. I, I wouldn't agree with that. I, mean, I, I think that what the approach um, to the savings is that we um, try to, to make those savings across the range of mm -hmm. the um, sure. directorates and services. Um, the reality is that there are are some services that you intend to make savings and that you just can't because if someone presents themselves at the door of the hospital, they need to mm -hmm. treatment. Um, so, in yes, some other I, areas, I get that, but I get that. But when you're providing very brief domiciliary care packages, people potentially finding themselves malnourished <coughs> as a result, then those people who could be kept in their own homes are now presenting at the very door. That you're trying to cut the costs and, and, and prevent them coming to. Yeah, I mean, so I'm I looking for the strategic approach to this that actually puts the resource into the area that TYC recognised as being the, the biggest area of concern. And that's exactly why I said that I think we need to put a significant impetus and energy behind the ongoing review that's been led by the Board and Domiciliary Care and the Associated Workforce Plan that falls from it. Um, I don't accept that we have salami sliced older people services, and particularly around domiciliary care. It's still an assessed need, and we believe that we're providing an assessed need on that basis. But certainly, the regional workforce plan is and will hopefully secure the agenda of identifying very, very clearly the demand that's coming in and the workforce that we require to, to you know, to meet that demand. Um, and that can't come soon enough. I, I would just finally comment that um, the financial challenges that all of the trusts are presented with just means that we have to have a much more um, a diverse approach to workforce planning because we have to use the resources in the most productive and efficient way possible. So from a workforce perspective, the, the financial challenges do mean retraining, diversification of skills, redeployment productivity, um, ensuring that we retain and attract the best talent because the pipeline of talent isn't as available. So that you know there are implications for how we do how we plan our, and, and use our workforce as a result. But um, that could be argued in any organisation I believe. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, um, finally just because uh, it's I um, mean we're alluding to it there, but one of the um, the, I suppose, assertions in, in TYC was that there was a requirement of a 3% reduction in workforce. Do you as trusts have a view to what 
um, the actual requirement does, because we're now told that was a working assumption. Well, as I say, I mean, I, I, it was a working assumption in 2011, but in 2015 the service is different than what it was in 2011, and certainly there's been a growth uh, in demand, um, and the, the expected shift left, as it was called, of moving resources out of hospital settings into community settings, while we have given examples where that has occurred, very clearly it has now been offset by growth in hospital services as well. And therefore, it has never, you know, it's a difficult one to be able to transparently say, yes, there's the 3% reduction. Uh, you know, there has been growth in both sectors. But are, are, we, are we now saying that, in fact, what is required is an increase in, in workforce? Well, our demand is growing at 6% per year, but yet our and financial investment has been coming into the health service, I think, has been set at 2%. So while certainly there's productivity challenges for us to rise to, Equally, the demands and service and our current configuration of service delivery model that we have within the, the, the health and social care family and environment causes a challenge both financially and the workforce. What, what, what I'm hearing, what I'm trying to tease out here, is that in order to implement transforming your care in the shift left, there would be a requirement to increase the current workforce. I, I think it's fair to say that for a lot of the initiatives that we mm -hmm. need to put in the ground in the, in the community, we do need transitional funding to, yeah. to establish Seed those. Money when they start yeah. to make real impact, I mean, I, I sh um, shared some examples for respiratory services. It's a, a, a um, making real impact on, on, you know, admissions and so on. Then, then it means that. that at some stage, we will no longer need the transitional funding. We'll be able to shift the money, money from one source to the other. But I think it is fair to say that that's that quite a few of these initiatives need transitional. But it's funding. an increase in staff as well as. <laughs> well, I mean, it may be temporarily. Funding, I mean, yeah. our funding is, is primarily spent on staff. I mean, the, ex so. the example I give about ambulatory care, prime in that, you know, um, we'll still have patients occupying beds that are admitted through the emergency department while we grow this ambulatory care service to try and prevent those things happening. It just doesn't, you know, stop on a Friday and start on a Monday that sort of way, you know. So there will be, a, you know, potential need for investment funding at the start and an increase in the workforce. Sir, sure, the traditional workforce that we employed ten or fifteen years ago to the workforce that we employ now is, is yeah. pulls apart. But do we have a sense of that overall? I know that this, you know, in terms of the board's responsibility, but as trusts, if it's not a three percent decrease, what is it? Uh, you know, how much of an increase is it? I think it's a it's a different workforce. You know, our workforce numbers it's might increase, but they might be completely different than than what they are now. You know, I think it's I, I used the term dynamic earlier on, and, and I really do mean that, and it's in it's, it's true sense. The type of individuals that we are employing now are the type that we alluded to during the course of some of those examples, the likes of AHP support workers, generic range of skills that previously we wouldn't have employed mm -hmm. five or six years ago, the physician assistant. So, do not. the regional workforce planning group have that analysis? I think it's important it's that difficult we, to get. we do work together to try and ensure that we develop that mm. thinking in a coalesced sense, right across the totality of everyone who has it. Uh, okay, uh, I'm, 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 going to, I'm going to close. I mean, I just find it ironic that somebody somewhere was able to calculate a three percent decrease in staff that was required to implement TYC, and now we're saying that was a working assumption, but we haven't got a figure. We know it's an increase, but we don't know how much. I think that, that's kind of part of the difficulty that we find ourselves in with this policy direction. But thank you for, for thank your you time much, and thank evidence you. today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, moving on to item five, which is the control of data processing bill um, departmental briefing. It's page 55 of your meeting pack, and departmental officials, I believe, are here. Today to brief us. Um, we just wait until they arrive. You're both very welcome. Um, Sharon Gallagher, Director of Corporate Services at the Department, and Chris Matthews, Head of Information 
Management Branch at the Department. Just going to invite yourselves to make the opening remarks, and we'll open it up to uh, questions and comments from members. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. Thank you for this further opportunity to brief the committee on the principles of the forthcoming Health and Social Care Control of Data Processing Bill. You may recall that Chris and I briefed the committee in October last year and February of this year. In February, I advised that, given the overwhelming support to the proposals, which manifested through the consultation process, the Department would progress to the legislative process. Yesterday, Minister Hamilton introduced the bill to the Assembly with the second stage scheduled for the 29th of June. The purpose of this bill is primarily to put in place a legal basis with robust checks and balances for the sharing of information which identifies a health and social care user for reasons other than their direct care in limited and controlled circumstances. This provision is already available in other jurisdictions, including England and Wales, where the benefits have been shown to, amongst other things, improve the planning and delivery of health and social care services, assess the effectiveness of existing policies, and provide information to inform the diagnosis and treatment of illnesses. By way of context, and as a reminder to the Committee, the HSC may already share a patient's information for non-direct care purposes if consent has been given. Where consent is not possible, new arrangements have been put in place to allow for the sharing of information where the patient's identity has been anonymised or pseudonymised. In the absence of consent, and where anonymised and pseudonymised information cannot secure the required outcome, organisations can already use patient-identifiable information <coughs> for purposes other than direct care. In these cases, the requirements set out under the Human Rights Act the Data Protection Act and the common law duty of confidentiality must be met. The requirements of the Human Rights Act and the Data Protection Act are clearly defined. However, aspects of the common law duty of confidentiality are less clear, and this can present a challenge. Under the common law duty of confidentiality, where consent has not been given, personal information may only be shared if there is a statutory basis for doing so, or if disclosure is deemed to be in the public interest. At present, because we do not have statutory authority, the use of patient identifiable information for any purpose other than direct care is predicated on the organisation's ability to satisfy the public interest test. Deciding what is or is not in the public interest is open to interpretation, and this creates a significant risk for patients, the HSC organisations that hold the information, as well as those who are using the information. The ambiguity about what constitutes public interest means that decisions may be more subjective and prone to challenge. Additionally, organisations may simply decide not to pursue this option in the absence of a robust framework, and as such, the associated benefits outlined earlier may not be realised. This is where this proposed legislation will come into play. The legislation would put in place a statutory framework to allow for the sharing of patient identifiable information in limited and controlled circumstances. The proposals would remove any ambiguity and safeguard the patient, the HSC and the information user. The bill would make provision for safeguards to be put in place, including an oversight body which would critically assess and be the decision-making authority in relation to requests for access to information. The issue of safeguards has been a strong theme during the consultation process, and for that reason the Department has decided that the detail around the governance arrangements will be subject to a separate consultation process, which will inform the regulations. These regulations will be subject to affirmative resolution. The Department has welcomed the regular opportunity to brief the Committee on the development of the Bill, and would be very happy to continue that level of engagement in developing the regulations. I would point out that the Department would envisage that approval to use patient identifiable information would only be granted in very limited circumstances, and where it can be proved that the results could not be achieved without access to the data sought, that it is not possible to secure consent, and that anonymised or pseudonymised information could not provide the same outcome. 
It is important to emphasise to the Committee that, based on the experience in other jurisdictions, it is the Department's view that, in the majority of cases, information that does not identify the patient will be sufficient to deliver the required outcomes. I would also stress that it will remain the Department's policy that, primarily, an individual's consent will be obtained for the use of their information. Thank you once again for the opportunity to brief the Committee, and Chris and I are very happy to address any questions you might have. Thank you, Sharon. Um, can I ask maybe just why has the bill gone beyond health and social care uh, into public interest, Chair? Mm -hmm. um, we looked at what was happening in other jurisdictions um, with particular attention to our close neighbours in England and Wales. Now, whilst they haven't invoked that provision to any great extent, we have had um, representation within Northern Ireland, particularly with um, organisations like the Northern Ireland Fire and Rescue Service, about using information in order to advance their agenda on community development and uh, their education and awareness programmes. So it wouldn't strictly fall under the, um, the health and social care, but it's more about education and uh, developing strategies to protect the most vulnerable in society. Well, what do you mean then by public interest? Public interest, um, there's no definition as such, it's based on case law, and it would be a requirement for the organisation who's making the application to prove or to evidence that um, sharing access and sharing of the information outweighs the protection or the, the, uh, the lack of disclosure of the information. So it very much puts the um, weight of evidence on the organisation. Well, well, maybe just because I mean, I'm looking at, at one of your clauses, the first clause one, part 1B, uh, and we talk here about um, the department making regulations, and I'll come back to some of that language, but um, as it considers necessary or expedient in the public interest. So what is necessary or expedient in the public interest? Um, that would be tested um, in, in the application. Um, as I said, there, there's, um, there is no definition for public interest per se. It is based on case law. It also refers to public interest as used in the Human Rights Act in terms of the definition. But it will be very much um, up to the organisation. And I think um, the example that I have outlined is a potential example in that area. In GB, they have used it for uh, some of their research requests, where the information that they received <coughs> did not actually change their approach to health and social care at that point in time, but, be, but could be used for future um, to, to inform future uh, policies or uh, delivery approaches. But would you accept then that maybe that's very broad? I would, I would accept it's broad, uh, Chair. Um, I guess uh, the next stage in terms of the regulations, the information available needs to be medical or social care, so obviously it's grounded in that premise. In terms of the public interest, I think it will be um, a key responsibility of the oversight group to assess each application and really critically assess whether or not the medical and social care information, the sharing of the medical and social care information, is necessary for, to advance a public interest, which does not cover health and social care. Um, so, so the representation that we have had from Fire and Rescue, I guess, is one example in terms of education awareness in, uh, of, of the most vulnerable. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, I do because I mean I think this is a critically important point, and you know there's there's reference um, in some of the initial um, the memorandums around social well-being referring to the qu to quality of life. Um, there's you know one of the clauses, clause ten a I think it is talks about care or treatment. Ten b talks about social well-being. Of an individual, um, we also see an 11b social well-being or other similar circumstances. Yes. You know, um, to me, social well-being can cover an absolute plethora of of social issues. 
You are absolutely right, Chair, and it was a concern that the Committee raised at, at a previous uh, briefing. We have taken that on board. We have actually grounded the social wellbeing reference in terms of the concept that was used in the 2009 Reform Act, which sets out the duty for the Department. Um, and it says, although there is no formal definition of this term, it may be taken to refer to the quality of life, social inclusion and the protection of the vulnerable in respect of individuals, families or committees. So we have taken on board your comments about being clear about our definitions and understanding what it is we mean, so that social wellbeing doesn't stray into other areas. Um, and hopefully, we've, uh, we, we've, um, we've described the circumstances in which it could be used. Yeah, but I mean, I'm noting that you were saying medical or social care, but other similar circumstances. You know, that's that's in eleven eleven B. Eleven B. Just bear with me. Yeah. Yeah. Um. It, it, I acknowledge the, the point that you are making, Chair. Um, I guess there needs to be some level of flexibility within the definitions that we have set out, because um, you know, the use of this could be quite broad in terms of the protection of the vulnerable, um, in terms of I am mean, looking at 11b at the minute, um, in, uh, including all forms of personal care and other practical assistance provided by individuals who, by reason of age, illness, disability, pregnancy, childbirth, Dependence. That's not an exhaustive list. Yeah, but the, the point is, or any other similar circumstances. Yeah, what you know, what other similar? You know, you've l given a list there of everything from pregnancy to dependence on alcohol or drugs, or any other similar circumstances. Um, it it is an illustrative list. Um, a social well-being. Uh, in terms of, of the qualification of what it means, it maybe as I've said, and I, I don't mean to, to repeat it, but maybe taken to refer to the quality of life, social inclusion, and the protection of the vulnerable. So that is quite broad, and it will be up to the organisation to actually prove how it sits within those definitions. Yeah, but if it's up to an organisation, I'm asking specifically the Department of Health. Then, mm -hmm. what is the, the, their definition when it comes to other similar circumstances? There isn't a defined right. definition of, of other similar circumstances. Okay. And, and I think it is it is the breadth of the term to allow some flexibility, Chair. Okay. okay. Well, I, I I would tend to look at this in, in the sense of as opposed to flexibility. Having a very clear, robust definition in, in place, and, and I'm just interested as well in why, you know, why we're using words like may. Um, I think it's in clause clause one. Um, yes, the department may, by regulations, make make provision for. Why would there not be a requirement? Why why would it be may? Why you? Know, You know, and I'm talking about even things like reasonably yeah. practicable. Yeah. Why, why would it not be absolutely essential? In terms of the the may make regulations, part of that is around the, the the regulations requiring the processing of information, which may be required. But the department may, in a in a serious set of circumstances, actually uh, seek to make regulations that would require the sharing of information in uh, a very serious situation that arises perhaps uh, in Northern Ireland, a pandemic or something similar, they may require that information to be made, so therefore they may make those regulations or bring those regulations forward. I think in addition to that, Chair, the, the may is in the acknowledgement that consent is our primary driver in this, then the anonymised and pseudonymised information. So there is no compulsion on the department to make provision on it. It may make provisions where the, um, where the conditions set out in the regulations are satisfied. And it is only for when consent has not been given? That is right. I mean, I, I, I have to say, I, I, there is an issue here about safeguards, and it is not even apparent, in my view. What the policy direction is, or what the policy objective is, 
the bill. We don't. We have a very, very broad, um, sweeping statements around social well-being, around care and treatment, around quality of life, and then we're talking about safeguards to protect or enhance issues that we haven't properly defined. And the the safeguards that will be put in place um, through the committee will be. Obviously, challenge the, the requests that the person uh, seeking to make use of the information will make. So, the, the, one of the safe, the, there are a range of safeguards. Uh, initially, you would have to, in making an application to the committee, you would have to prove to them why consent wasn't or is impractical and why you can't achieve the same outcome from pseudonymisation or anonymisation. And in fact, in the, the 900 applications that England and have processed since 2001. Uh, a third of those have actually been rejected, and many of the 600 that have been actually approved have had very stringent uh, requirements placed on them in terms of um, how the data is handled, how it's processed, and actually the amount of information that the requester can access, but they can only access it if the person who owns the information is prepared to share it. This is only an enabling bill. It won't actually make a requirement on the person who holds the data to share it. They will make an assessment based on the risk of the relationship that they have with the service provider, or sorry, with the service user, as to whether they feel or deem it appropriate to share that service user's information. Is, is it is it to make right something that's not um, procedurally correct at the moment in terms of sharing data? It's, it's not that it's not procedurally correct. It's just it's open to a heightened level of challenge, because there's no legal basis for it. It does happen at the minute, and I think that's that's a, a key driver for the department. Um, I mean, the Cantor Registry and the Cerebral Palsy Registry both do it. Both share the information. They have opt-outs in place. They have information in place, but they rely on the satisfying the public interest under the common law. Uh, under common law, duty of confidentiality, and that's the risk here for key organisations that they don't have the legal basis to do it. So the safeguards primarily are that the, 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 um, any decisions need to comply with the Data Protection Act, but that the committee makes a decision in light of the regulations that we would set out, and that's the key safeguards around this. So there is an element, an absolute element, of pro providing additional protection to decisions that are currently being taken. And you see, just just something else that I wanted to refer to. Um, the original explanatory note talked about uh, you used actually this phrase, assist research. So this data, patients' data, would be used to assist research. What 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 does that mean? What what research or what's the type of research or breadth? Well, it obviously it has to be health and social care related, but it, it could help research. There's no guarantee that an application by somebody wishing to carry out a piece of research would be granted. It's back to the point about the other safeguards that are in place around seeking consent uh, and also using anonymised or pseudonymised information. There's a new process as part of this overall uh, package that has been set up within the business services organisation. Uh, to provide anonymised or, or pseudonymised information, but it also has to have ethical approval before you would even consider. But it, but it ultimately, as it stands now, data could be shared to assist research that would be viewed to be in the public interest, or to be, you know, a, a social well-being of an individual. Currently, it would be extremely unlikely that it would be shared for research at this point in time. But in this, in this bill, in this bill, in this bill, it, it could be shared if it is deemed that, that it has the, the necessary public interest benefits, and that the committee scrutiny believes that, um, as well as having the ethical approval, that it meets the requirements uh, of the committee in terms of uh, a safe uh, and beneficial approach. So data could be shared if it's deemed to be in the public interest. And again, I go back to my point, and I think, Sharon, you agreed with that, that a definition around social wellbeing of an individual is very general. Yeah, the definition of, of social wellbeing, but, but it has to have a direct impact, in, in obviously, in terms of health and social care. The public interest is, a, is a, an underlying 
requirement, it still has to have a health and social care aspect. So you can't just have. Uh, well, why uh, use social well-being then? Because it, there's also the potential benefits in terms of social well-being as part of health and social care. So it, why it has to be within health and social care? There could be a social care well-being. One of the issues, for example, is, as Sharon had alluded to, was the research for something that may into a particular medical condition that may or may not um, be an area that is uh, taken forward in the future. But there would be a public interest in perhaps understanding the issues around that particular illness at this point in time, and that may get approval by the committee in terms of giving them access to the information. I just think, I mean, social wellbeing could be anything from access to housing to education to, uh, you know, that that's not definitive. That's not definitive in, a, in any shape, form, or fashion on this. I think you're right. I mean, the definition is grounded in in the 2009 Reform Act, which sets out the duties of the department. You're right. It it is broad, chair, and and it, it may be used. I mean, to consider some of those broader aspects, it it does need to be proven that consent can't be given. They can't use anonymised and pseudonymised information. There's no other way of doing this. So that narrows it down in terms of how and when it could be used. There will need to be a determination, an assessment and a determination taken by the oversight group, the advisory group, in relation to whether or not the sharing of information in this circumstance is reasonable and is necessary. Yeah, and I'm just you know, going through this again, and you keep referring to the oversight group, but even in relation to this, and it's part two, Part two uh, on, on page three of the bill, which is the establishment of a committee to authorise processing of confidential information, um, and it talks about for purposes of subsection two, the department may, by regulation, establish a committee. So there isn't even a requirement to do that. Yes, I, I accept it. I accept that. Um, I mean, certainly, that that's the intention. Um, but you would, you know, I would suggest that in a bill, it's if that is the intention, then it's a requirement, as opposed to me. If if this is the oversight, in terms of the definition uh, and benchmarking of issues around social well-being. Yeah, I, I think the intention it was stronger than me. Yeah, and I would accept that. Too. I think the intention wasn't to predetermine the um, what would be happening in terms of bringing forward the regulations for consideration by making it that we will establish a committee. The intention would be to establish it, but obviously the regulations will need to to. Um, but then I know I suggest that that's reflected in the bill. Yes, in black and white, yes. not me. I think that's, that's, that's helpful, Chair, and we'll take that on board. I mean, certainly in terms of the consultation, 98 per cent of, of our respondees had said that they would be absolutely in favour of an oversight group by some uh, form, and that is, is certainly the direction of travel. Okay, and I think Fergal had indicated. Can I just uh, revisit some of the stuff around the, sort of the policy objective? And uh, it does say, you, you, I mean, I notice in the first part of 1 1. It talks about medical or social care purposes. And already, we've had here, if you like, contested case around what all that means, uh, and then it goes into in the interest of improving health and social care, or in the public interest. Yeah. So that becomes an or in the public interest. So what overrides? It, it, but it's grounded in the need for it to be under for medical or social care purposes, the public interest. Would still have to be grounded in the need of medical but, or social care. But even support. already, I mean, you know, a health and social care. I mean, the chair is right. That extends right out. Who, who, who defines that? Who defines that? It certainly goes beyond NIFRS requesting information. I would suggest. Okay, I suppose, and it's back to uh, the example. That, that I had used previously, where you would be looking at a particular condition at this point in time, 
but that the, you wouldn't be intending to move that forward under health and social care? Yeah, I suppose for us it must be what, how, how wide we open the gate to access information and for what purpose. And the policy objective, for example, is uh, described as a public good. Now, what's that? I can, I can, you know, when it, it sounds sunny and nice and fluffy and all the rest, but what does that mean? And I suppose this is where the uh, back to the, the position with the committee and the robustness of their scrutiny in relation to the applications that come through that would seek to access that information, and whether they deem it yeah. it has a public interest uh, in in actually providing that information on a health and social care for health and social care purposes. Yes, but but I, I, I can sense from your demeanour and in some of your replies that you're accepting that that some of this is opening that gate much wider than even the context that you're describing. I've forgotten the example that you gave. Fire and rescue service? No, the, the, the next one in relation to specific conditions. There was a specific condition where people are now giving information in relation in to example, the cancer, cancer registry. Cancer registry. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. uh, so this would extend and could extend, notwithstanding what you're saying or protections around the committee, way beyond all of that. In other words, the committee could be looking at a whole raft of stuff which this provision would allow for, but isn't even actually in, in, in the context of what you're describing or the limited context. This is much, much broader, or could, could in, uh, uh, in my view, extend much broader than the narrow individual cases or uh, treatments or information areas that you've described. I think the, the safeguard built into that, uh, one of the safeguards built into that in terms of this test of public interest is that the organisations do need to set out in very clear terms why the outcome couldn't be achieved in any other way. Do you know what those organisations, have you uh, in your mind a vision of what types of organisations, are they private companies doing? Uh, no, absolutely not. This, this isn't for, for private purposes to advance that aim. But certainly, I mean, in terms of the consultation, in terms of engagement with um, Fire and Rescue Services, the most prominent one, because they've been quite vocal on, uh, in terms of the, the consultation, um, that this is an area, the public interest is certainly an area that they would like to invoke because the purposes of this isn't for improving, improving health and social care per se but is in towards the education and awareness of vulnerable people in society that have presented to A&E or presented to hospital as a result of, of um, fire. Yeah, but that, uh, I understand that, but it doesn't say that here. It is a very broad definition of public interest, a very broad definition of public good. The defin I guess um, what I would say is there's no actual definition of public interest, unfortunately. It is based on case law. It is grounded on the medical or social care purposes. And it is very much a decision that will be taken by the committee on the basis of a very sound argument given forward by organisations that they cannot get the same outcome by any other means and that they are adhering to the Data Protection Act and the Human Rights Act. So there are safeguards around that. But you're absolutely right. The def it is it is broad, um, and it. But, uh, by the way, I'm not attaching a motivation to that. It's just that by its definition, it could be broad and used elsewhere simply because of its vagueness and broadness. Would you accept that? I think um, I, I expect that. Uh, I guess I accept that there's a potential for that if you don't have the appropriate safeguards in place. Um, the experience of England and Wales, who has this provision and who have over 10 years in terms of um, making these decisions and seeing these decisions, um, you know, uh, they have very few applications coming to them using the public interest test. Their definition of it is quite different because they would um, make some decisions under public interest where the health and social care benefits cannot be readily realised. Now, we wouldn't necessarily see those sitting in that category. So the example, particularly we had the NIFRS example in mind uh, because we had, we've, we've looked at this public interest again on foot of, of engagement. Can we, can we get sight of some of the experience of elsewhere? In terms of cost benefit analysis, etc. Et et Indeed. Please. Thank you. Indeed. Does that exist? And maybe that was requested earlier, I'm not sure. No, no, no. I'm just, I'm just wondering at this point, does that, on Fergal's point, does that exist currently? Do you, in terms of what other areas, other jurisdictions, cost benefit analysis? 
you need even I'm not sure we have a cost benefit analysis. We certainly have. Um, uh, there is a repository uh, of decisions that have been taken. Uh, by the um, Confidential Advisory Group in England and Wales, and will set out the purpose of the information and the types of decisions that were made. Um, and public interest is always one that uh, they consider, even where there is a health and social care benefit. So it is, it is um, accepted that it is a critical aspect of the decision-making process. Is this copycat legislation? Is it word for word? No, yes. no, no. It, it's not. So we've we've taken account we... of of a number of of uh, local uh, changes in terms what, what, of health, what, an integrated health and social care system. What is the English system used then in terms of legislating for their access? Are there? The broad framework is uh, generally the same. The structures underpinning it will have some changes. Yes, but, but what legislation are they using? Where are the words and what bill or act does it exist? Oh, the act is set out in, if you bear with me one second. It's uh, section 60 of the Health and Care Act 2001 is where it initially commenced. And it's been through a number of iterations. It, and if it has got all the robust um, uh, safeguards, should we just copy that potentially? Well, well we could we could uh, copy it. I mean, the purpose of I guess taking it stage by stage and setting out the broad provision in the bill, and then. Uh, uh, entering into further uh, consideration and consultation through the regulations is to make sure the model for Northern Ireland reflects the needs for Northern Ireland. You're accepting that this is broader than what they have in England? It's the same, uh, it's the same provision in terms of public interest. They, they have that provision in... Yeah. Maybe it would be worthwhile just seeing some comparator there in terms of the legislation. And maybe even help short circuit some of the work, uh, because if they have the robust safeguards that you're talking about, and we're sitting clearly puzzling over some of these broader issues that I think even our earlier comments uh, uh, have reflected on in terms of our some anxiety around this, that uh, that may be helpful in terms of. So it's a comparison and contrast yeah. of the. Yeah. Please. Is that, sorry, Chair. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. And, and just to clarify, the cost benefit analysis has that been done? Is there one? No, we need to check. Uh, I suspect not, because no, over the period of the 14 years, there's been 600 um, decisions made. It would be to, you would need to go back to the organisations to cross-check in terms of whether or not the outcome uh, of the research or of the piece of work actually. But yeah, for here. Benefit. For here, for here, yeah. for this piece of legislation, it's not. Mm. Sorry, Chair, could I just oh, can we even have a list of the six hundred organisations? Yeah, it's all it's all published. They publish everything on the web, so we can certainly give you access oh, to that information. Okay, okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Fergal thank you. and Pam. Next, thank yeah. you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Um, just for clarification, the information that's being to be gathered is currently been gathered. Yes, it's the existing information within the HSC. And that's open to challenge. That's right. From individuals who, well, obviously, if they discover that it has been shared, um, would it not be simpler just to simply gain consent? You, the, the difficulty in, in gaining consent is that you face a situation where you're asking somebody to consent to something that they don't know what will happen necessarily with the information. So if you consent overall, then you're consenting to anything happening with your information, where there are people who would choose not to and choose to opt out if their information being shared, and that can currently uh, be the case. But we do need to be sure that we don't just, I suppose, open, open the doors and let the information be shared uh, by anybody for, for any purpose. Your primary driver is absolutely so consent is the main premise. There may be situations where it's simply impractical to do that. And a good example is back in 2011, where there was a decision taken to pay uh, winter fuel payments to cancer sufferers uh, across a departmental initiative, and um, it was simply, you know, too difficult to get consent from every single 
cancer sufferer at that point in time. Um, had we had this legislation, we could have gathered the information in a more expedient way. But as it happened, we had to go through the GPs and we had to source information in a very piecemeal type of way. So it was about the practicalities of getting consent from every single person suffering that illness at that point in time. I understand that. Oh, I can't imagine too many cancer sufferers taking a challenge against you for no. yes. making a payment to you. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay. Just, just to go back to that point. I mean, he said that this is, is about, you know, seeking consent in a situation where effectively um, somebody and 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 layperson speak hadn't given that consent. So this legislation could ultimately, you know, if somebody opts out of giving that information. This legislation, on the basis of a definition of public interest, can override that person's decision. It's the opt-out yes. has, has yes. premacy. Yes. The opt-out has yes. premacy. Yeah. But what about if there's a definition taken by this committee that may be set up that it's in the public interest or that's actually social, social well-being? Well, in the, in the circumstances in, in England and Wales, the committee um, doesn't override the individual's opt-out. They've made a conscious it's decision it, it, not it, to. It never they has. No, they haven't. They have never um, advised the Secretary of State that they would be content to override the opt-out if somebody has consciously opted out or dissented, as they would refer to it as. But, then, but ultimately, I suppose the question is, in this bill as it currently stands, the committee could well, override then, a person's opt-out? Well, under data protection, the person can choose to opt out of having their information shared, and also the applicant would have to prove fair and lawful processing and prove to the committee that there should be a reason as to why somebody who has opted out cannot continue to have opted out of having their information yeah, shared. Yeah, but the, the committee, yeah. as it stands, if it defined uh, a, a request for sharing of that data in the public interest or in terms of social wellbeing, could override a person's opt-out? Well, what would actually happen is, in terms of making that decision, that's enabling. So, therefore, the person who holds the information, so say from the HSC organisation, the choice is theirs as to whether they release that but, information but or it's, not. But it's legislation. It's, it's, you know, there's a proposed bill in front of us which yeah. would give the power. So, I'm really looking for yes or no on this. This bill, as it currently stands, okay. Could allow that established committee to override a person's opt out for data sharing because it's deemed to be in the public interest? They could, but there okay. are more circumstances. Okay, no, no, that's, that's what I was that's attempting right. to get to. Oh, okay. Did you finish there, Pam? Yes. I think so, Chair. Sure. Okay. And Joanne? Thank you, Chair. Um, apologies for missing your briefing, so my question may already have, have been covered. Um, in the written briefing in point 13, it talks about steps which have been taken to reduce the risk of loss of personal information. Um, can you outline the steps which already have been taken? To reduce the... Yeah, the loss of personal, point 14, con continuing with, under the heading, continue with the current arrangements. I think the, the first stage of this was working with the health and social care organisations in order to improve uh, their information management processes. Chris will maybe talk yeah. a little bit more, more about the detail uh, that, that happened. Yeah, th this piece of legislation is part of a three-year strategy that we have been doing to strengthen and improve um, information sharing uh, whilst protecting information. So we have put in place a number of um, structures, we have introduced senior information risk owners within all of the within all of the HSC organisations whose responsibility it is to manage the information. We have increased the um, level of governance over information governance uh, within the HSC organisations uh, over that period that of time. Um, it's all, it started um, just about three and a half years ago and it has been uh, a developing process till we got to this stage. Uh, we have also put in place uh, standardised processes for sharing service user information to ensure that the systems are robust and that there are appropriate sign-offs in terms of any information that is being shared. 
Uh, we've also made sure that every member of staff has received training uh, through online or through instructor ed training as well to ensure that they uh, know what to do. And we've asked the Privacy Advisory Committee to review the code of practice on the sharing of service user information, which happened in, initially was done in 2009 and reviewed in 2012. Uh, and we've also introduced an honest broker service, which is where if you need information within the HSC, that you would make an application to that um, uh, organisation within the business services organisation and they will provide you, if it's available, with information which is anonymised or pseudonymised. So we've actually uh, reduced the amount, uh, the need for identifiable information within the HSC family, but also improved the ability to make information available to the HSC family in an anonymised or pseudonymised way that they can use for planning purposes. That alarms me, and I know, you know others feel the same in the committee. All this essentially blow the radar, people knowing their information is being shared. I, I, I know my son's a transplant patient and I've never once been aware that his details or information about him and his transplant has, has been shared. I've certainly never been asked or approached and neither is he. So, you know, it, it concerns me a lot on what has been happening and what is proposed to happen further with it. Um, you describe provisions in the bill as much more robust. Why do you feel then they are? You've outlined just outlined what you've been doing the last three and a half years. Why do you feel then they're more robust than the steps you've already taken? What's different from what's already gone before, given the fact that what's gone before largely general public is I'm certainly have, have have been unaware of it. I know my son has. Yeah. Uh, well I can uh, just to reassure you that in terms of the sharing of information within the health and social care sector, uh, the vast, vast majority of it is shared for direct care purposes. This is talking about information shared for purposes other than direct care. So uh, in terms of assessing the level of sharing, um we would be uh, Whilst some sharing does take place, uh, most of it is in an anonymised or a pseudonymised way, um, even prior to the, the setup of the Honest Broker Service. Um, but we just took additional steps because we wanted to obviously look at this legislation uh, position. The legislation will put a robust process in place for identifiable information, so that it not only will it, um, you know, provide the legal cover information that is being shared for the likes of the cancer registry and cerebral palsy registry, it will also then enable information to be shared for purposes that we currently don't share it for. And there have been a number of national audits and pieces of work that Northern Ireland has not been involved in and has not uh, attained, obtained and the benefits from. Then open the floodgates for where the information goes, because you said sharing for direct care only yeah. and being anonymous, and therefore if you're going to make this uh, as you say, much more robust, but essentially you're making it easier to access people's. But e easier to access in limited and controlled circumstances. So why she will be able to access it? And for example, you know, since 2001, England have only had and we have had 900 applications for the information over that period of time, of which about 600 have been successful. But part of this, I suppose, also to make the point is. Uh, in accessing the information, in many instances, the information that will be accessed will be the information to enable you to contact the service user to ask them would they would they consent to being involved in whatever piece of inf piece of analysis or research that is being carried out. We're up to now; they haven't known. We, because well, up to now, we haven't done it in a lot of instances, and we can't actually give the information to. For example, this cancer payment, we weren't able to give the information to contact the cancer patient to ask them did they want the payment. So in many instances, the vast majority of the, the information would be used to contact the individual without being specific about what the issue is and ask them to contact the organisation to ascertain are they happy to be involved in whatever the piece of work may actually be. My, my concern, just as you said, limited and controlled circumstances, very limited and how, how controlled that would be. And that's, again, back to the committee. First of all, showing them that um, why consent isn't possible or practical, why you can't obtain the information through pseudonymisation or anonymisation, and why the only practical solution to obtain uh, the outcome that's required for a health and social care benefit is to have access to identifiable. But again, 
that will be in the main to contact the individual to seek their consent to be involved in whatever the piece of work may happen to be. And, and if I could add to that, it, it grounds it back to the medical and social care purposes in the interests of improving health and social care in the public interest and in full adherence to the Data Protection Act and the Human Rights Act. It takes back to Fergal's point, I think, with the safeguards and what lessons can be learned from other jurisdictions with safeguards in place, and that's something I think we would certainly need to explore in greater detail. What, just, just on, I mean, what, what if the person is deceased? If the person is deceased at this point in time, then you technically can't access the information. The Data Protection Act only refers to living individuals. You can't override that original opt-out of a person that said... Well, um, that they are they're not having their information shared? Back to the, to the point that you would made about the committee overriding the decision. Um, I do not know how many cases where you would have an individual who has deceased and who had opted out, but in cases where individuals are deceased, then it is impossible to gain consent. And Depending on the course of whatever the research is, the committee could give the authorisation to access that information because there is no other means of doing so. So the committee could... Override that. Again, yeah, it goes back yeah. to the previous. It, it could thing. potentially, see, but then the, the data holder may, under data protection or under human rights, may decide not to release that information. But there would still be ultimate debt power there that that could, could happen. The power is to make the decision. The power isn't to ensure that the information is released because it's enabling legislation. Okay, um, Rosie had indicated. Joanne, sorry, you, you yes, finished. I'm yes, finished, sure, yeah. right. uh, um, Rosie. Yeah. Gore Michael Carley, and thanks for the presentation. It's in relation to the code of practice, um, where it says uh, this is obviously what's going to dictate how everything should be carried out and all of that. What it says is the um, department must, as soon as reasonably practical, prepare a published code of practice on the processing of information. So this will be what guides, if that was the case. But it says uh, in a couple of places must have regard to the code of practice. Does that do you feel is that robust enough? You know, should it not be must adhere? It may have regard. Well, well, it's like you can pick it or leave it. Well, it's maybe just the way it's worded. It's not the, the code of practice actually sets out the detailed practical guidance on the sharing of information and the things that you need to consider. At this point in time, the Code of Practice does not have any legal standing, apart from obviously linked to data protection and human rights. But the Code of Practice obviously will need to be, we have one, but in light of the legislation it obviously would be revised and it would be more robust, obviously, if the Bill makes its way through and we have the regulations in place. But it is expected that the organisations give due regard because the Code of Practice reflects data protection and that is a legal requirement. So it, it, there would be a requirement that people take into consideration, because there are other factors that may influence the decision as to whether the information is shared or not. Uh, there may be legal reasons why the information should or shouldn't be shared, or child protection. But they have to look at the, obviously the processors practice. Okay, it just it just strikes me when you have a choice of words, and if it's something that must be followed, why you would not use the most. Well, that, I, th I think due regard means that it's one of the issue, one of the pieces of governance and advice that you consider in the overall picture of deciding whether to share. It doesn't stand by itself. It's data protection, human rights, and other issues need to obviously be considered. And I, th I think that's obviously the, the tone that's it's used for. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. And um, Alex, next. Yeah. Um, thank you for your presentation so far. Um, some of these might sound stupid, so I apologise. <laughs> okay. Is this in place in, a, in other parts of the United Kingdom? Pardon? Is this already in place in other parts of the United Kingdom? It's, it's been in place in England and Wales since 2001. What about Scotland? Scotland currently don't have the legal uh, basis for it. They're keeping it under review. Okay. Um, but they do have a privacy advisory committee that give advice and guidance in relation to the sharing of information. Okay. Um, my next question is, people who refer to the committee to, to get the information, so theoretically anybody could refer to the committee, or is it just people who are health related? No, I think anybody so, could make an application to the so committee. I could. You could you potentially, could. but 
obviously, you know, your case would be scrutinised as to why you want the information. And if it was research related, you would have to have ethical approval yep. before you approached them. But why would anyone want access to medical notes if it was a medical condition? Why would they even be? I think that's probably the debate that we had earlier in terms of the public interest and um, what scenarios that might play out. Um, and it's, I think I said earlier, in England and Wales, their experiences, they haven't invoked that provision very often. But given our consultation in Northern Ireland, particularly in relation to Fire and Rescue Service, we do see um, at this point that there is an opportunity to use the public interest test for the, for the information. Um, for that particular set of circumstances, yeah. as long as it was a robust case and, it, and it, 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 the checks and balances were in place and it was compliant with Data Protection and, and Human Rights Act. Okay. And my last question. This hasn't been in place, obviously, so this being in place, will that cover any information that's been shared in the past? No. No. Okay. It'll be moving forward. Okay. And can I just ask then, who, who, who gives the ethical approval or not? The, it's right. the Ethics Committee, it's, um, which is established across the UK-based structure. Okay. Uh, there are offices in Northern Ireland, but they work collaboratively to, uh, to um, assess applications. And, and who typically would apply to that organisation for ethics approval? We usually a researcher. Most often at this point in time, it would be for university researchers. Um, but then, for example, in relation to the Honest Broker Service, we have that process involves the Ethics Committee, where people would apply to access anonymised or pseudonymised information for a piece of research that they are doing. But it has to have health and social care benefit. And there are robust governance processes uh, built in around the, the access to that information, but it's only for anonymised or pseudonymised information. Okay, you okay? Fergal? Okay. okay, well, Chair, sorry, can I go back on one point that Fergal and yourself raised earlier in relation to cost benefit analysis of this bill? And, and I apologise if I picked you up incorrectly. Um, whilst we have no um, robust cost benefit analysis, we envisage that the cost of introducing this bill will be nominal. We have a, a number of committees already extant in Northern Ireland that we envisage, without predetermining the outcome of the consultation, that we envisage could execute this role. So any additional cost would be nominal. We uh, would envisage that would outweigh the benefits in terms of the protection of the organisation, the safeguards of information, um, of client information, and also the benefits that could be realised by accessing the information, particularly in relation to the experience in Wales and England. Okay. Can I thank you both then for your time and detail today? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, um, just by way of, of conclusion on this part, uh, I'm asking for members' views in relation to supporting the principles of the, of the bill at this stage. Uh, it's certainly my view um, that what's in front of us is too broad in terms of a, of a policy objective um, in terms of, of that conversation that we've had around definition of public interest, social wellbeing and a number of our very important vital issues that flow from it, that the bill as it stands, in my view, um, we can't offer support to, to go through next stage. I'm asking our members in agreement with that. Is that the general consensus in the room? Or is there, is there uh, different views? Okay, on, on the basis of that, um, are we suggesting that as a committee, yes, Alec, yeah. Sure. Do we not get to scrutinise the bill? Only if it goes through second stage. So we do, as a committee, have, have uh, I suppose, a responsibility to agree at this stage whether we can support this going through second stage. That's no further judgment on the bill itself. But as a committee, we're being asked at this juncture, can we support the principle of the bill going to second stage? And it is my view that, that the support in terms of what we heard today um, is not there in relation to the, the broad principles of the bill. Okay. I don't totally agree because, you know, 
we're talking about words like may and different things like that which can be changed at scrutiny and things like that so i i don't see why we should be trying to totally disrupt the bill right now and that can be rectified at the committee stage well, I think it's in, in my view, and I'm you know open to listening to other members on it. It's much more than words like me. Um, there's been a clear debate there, and I think it has been alluded to by the department themselves that there is a lack of clarity around key issues like in the public interest, yeah. mm -hmm. how that's defined, or indeed social well-being, uh, and an acceptance that that is very broad. So I think it is much much more than just you know, smaller words, um, and again, I'm. There are still words that can get clarification as we go through the bill. So, what are we going to say? We're going to knock the bill for next week altogether, or something? Well, the point the point is that we couldn't get clarification today. In my view, uh, we we didn't get that clarification today in terms of a clear definition, for example, of what was public interest. Um, there was also an issue that the oversight of this would be through the establishment, or maybe, as, as, as according to the bill, through the establishment of, of a committee. Um, you know, it, it, it certainly wasn't clear, in my view, that the intent or the policy um, objective of the bill was, was, was very clear. In my view, it was very, very broad. It did, it did come across. Do you have the option broad. of no, simply noting it at this stage? We do have the option of simply it. To, Which to, we, to we, next can't, week we can't forward. defer it. Now, we're being asked whether we actually support this bill going now to the second stage. And if we note it, it, it will go to the yes. second stage, yes. which will come to the floor of the Assembly and it can be decided at that point. Yeah, I'm going to ask the clerk to step us through what options mm -hmm. are there. There are a number of options. I mean, you could note the bill um, and just highlight the concerns that you have. You could support it and sort of outline what areas you want to scrutinise further. Um, you could not support it and leave it at that, you know, or um, you could, if you really wanted to, you could put down a reasoned amendment, um, and that's an amendment um, providing a reason why you don't feel it should um, pass second stage. If it doesn't pass second stage, that's it for the bill. If it passes second stage, it will come to the committee. There will be legislation. So you're saying, yes, I support the principles of this legislation. The legislation will come to committee, and at that point, it's a matter of tweaking it or amending it, whatever, the proposing amendments. So if the committee simply did not support the bill, it would still, but didn't put a reasoned amendment it's, down, it would still go yeah, to the It's the assembly, assembly who decides. It's not the committee who decides, but, you know, it's complex for the, for the committee to, to have a view. Yeah, and to advise the assembly off that view, because it's this committee who has the knowledge of the bill. But do you not doing the bill, Chair, because it's too broad and we haven't got into the nitty gritty of it and may maybe making changes? Don't get me wrong, there's areas of concern I have too and they do need to be addressed, but why knock the bill down now when you know, we can address those through the committee stage or through amendments and whatever? Well, it's not about it's not about getting the bill down now. It's saying that as it currently stands, what we're moving to is not clause by clause scrutiny. We're moving to um, the the policy objective of the, or the principles of the bill. And as it stands, in my view, I've, I've said it three times now. Um, I don't see that they are well enough defined. I can't be any clearer than that. Um, you know. I've said it now three or four times, so um, yeah, I think we should uh, we should note it and highlight the concerns at this point. No issues can be defined as we go along. It's not, yeah, there's no reason to not. Do what it. do other people think? Will, will, Chair, will, will there be any other uh, witnesses to give uh, any information on this? Only when we move, if it goes through second stage and if it goes through the next stage and comes back to the committee, only then. But at this stage, just be mindful, we are dealing with the principles of the bill. But surely, Chair, if, if we note it and highlight the concerns that we have, surely those concerns could be addressed um, during the debate? Would that be another opportunity for us? It's either noting it, folks here at this stage, 
noting it and noting the concerns. And it will go to the. I mean, the clerk has outlined this. It will go to the assembly, or it's whether we are saying at this stage we are raising those concerns, we are noting it, and we are looking to bring a, a reasoned amendment forward. That's the two options, as I see it. I don't hear any consensus in the room that what currently is on the table that this committee could actively support. No. So there's two options there. We note, and you know, folks, I'm guided by yourselves. We note the concerns, highlight the concerns. The bill will go to the floor of the Assembly for debate, or we note the concerns, express our lack of support for those, and consider a reasoned amendment. I I mean, if the objective of the exercise, sorry, would you? Sorry, Rosie, we had, sorry, I, I, mean, I, I think we should go for the amendment. I mean, I think that there are too many areas of concern. It, it is too broad. It's, if it was just maybe a bit. Here, a small bit, but it's just those public interest and those uh, that social well-being. They're just too, they're too ill-defined. They're not defined, and it's where it could go. Why does it need to be? It strikes me it doesn't need to be that wording. And why is it in that wording? Okay, okay. For but Fergal had I'm indicated to there as work, well. Work this out in my own head. But if the object, I mean, we have all collectively here raised concerns about this. Uh, sufficient to say that we're not happy with it in its present form or even its policy objective because it goes much 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 broader than than that if you let it go through then uh, you are assenting to some of the things you've actually disagreed with principally and you're now letting it go through another process which may allow it to go through in this form and, and, and actually be enacted and yet this committee will have sat at the very earliest stages and said, I, I mean that through the mathematics of the Senate, so, and that's democracy. But if we're sitting with major concerns, then I think it has got to be that this has to be knocked back. It may be up to the health authorities to come back at another point with a, 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 a much greater definition. But I don't see that greater definition necessarily coming through as a result of supporting it through to the second stage. Okay, and Pam, with Andy Kelly. I, I, I would propose that we note it and highlight the concerns and let it go forward for the debate. I mean, yes, we were all scrutinising today and we weren't talking about the good points, we weren't talking about anything positive that may already come out of uh, this practice or could come out of the practice in the future, and I'm sure there is plenty that we could have talked about. So I think it should be noted at this stage in that way the committee is not having to show its hand at this stage and we can see what way the concerns are addressed in the debate. Okay, well look, you've made a formal proposal there, Pam. Um, I think it has to go to a vote in relation to this. So your, your, your proposal is that, that we note? I I'm, 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 I'm note. Note, note and highlight our concerns. And there, obviously, there's another school of thought that says we need to bring forward a reasoned amendment. Is that where? But how do you get a reasoned amendment out of what, what, what the, the range of? Um, I mean, that would have to be substantially amended on all on all levels, right back to the policy. But that would that would be up to, I suppose, the clerks to go away and mm. and engage on. So, do you want to put? Do you want to put your proposal to the? Yes, sir. Okay. Second. Okay. Um, show of hands for people who are in favour of simply noting. 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 Chair, my proposal was to note and highlight the concerns. Okay. And is there another proposal? I propose that we choose the amendment route. Right? We just voted for it. <laughs> okay, so it doesn't. Eyes and nose and nose, then would be you, Rosie and Virgil. If you just so it just. It. So it, sorry, <laughs> you four had voted in favour of Pam's no. proposal. No. So it's just in terms of against that, then? That's what needs to be documented here, so. Yeah. So Rosie, Virgil, and the chair. Okay. And are you formally putting that on our proposal, or. She doesn't. There's no point. Okay. 
Okay, so it is the case then that the committee are saying you note note the concerns um, that have been raised in relation to the data processing bill. I'm is that okay. that inaccurate? Of course, now we have to define what those concerns are. Yes. And yes. Maybe the clerk could uh, confirm the wording there. The, the, the question I had was that um, this committee notes the introduction of the full name of the bill um, and agrees to highlight the concerns uh, at second stage. And those and concerns do to have to be addressed, they do? Because they uh, yeah. concerns. It might be, the end be a difficult one. Mm -hmm. Okay, members, moving quickly on. Item six is uh, an SL1, which is a controlled drug supervision of management and use 2015. It's page 78 of your pack. Uh, the department is proposing to make a statutory rule to improve controlled drug governance uh, without hindering patients from accessing the treatment that they need. Uh, the rule will be subject to a uh, negative resolution procedure. Are members content? That the department makes a statutory rule. Agreed. Item seven, the Honey Regulations 2015, which are on page 103. Um, just reminding members again that the committee considered and approved the SL1 for our rule for this rule, sorry, and are meeting on the 15th of April 2015. There's been no changes to policy uh, since the SL1 was submitted to the committee, and the examiner statutory rules has no issues to raise. So are members content with the statutory rule? Therefore, the Committee for Health, Social Services and Public Safety has considered SR 2015 number 261, the Honey Regulations 2015, has no objection to the rule. It is an, an SR 2015 266, which is the Optical Charges and Payments Amendment Regulations. It is on page 122 of the meeting folder. Um, the Committee considered and approved the SL1 on the 3rd of June 2015. There has been no changes to the policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the committee, and the examiner of statutory rules has no issues to raise. Are members content with the statutory rule? Agreed. So the Committee for Health, Social Services and Public Safety has considered SR 2015 number 266, the optical charges and payments, and has no objection to the rule. Item 9 is a forward work programme. Page 132 of the meeting folder, just asking members to note. Um, item 10, there are nine items under matters arising. I um, just want to refer to a number of them. Pages 134 to 146 are responses from the Minister, um, mostly regarding the issues raised through our recent stakeholder event, issues raised by Age Sector Platform, VoIPIC, Bogside and Brandywell Forum. Clare, Action for Children, Save the Mid and ME Support. I am asking members if they are content to forward a copy of the relevant response to each organisation. Right. Right. And page 147 is a response from the Minister in relation to the issues raised in the Human Rights Commission inquiry. The Minister has indicated that he has not had sufficient time to consider the issues fully, but has given an undertaking to appraise the committee in due course. Are members content to note this in the meantime? Right. And page 148 is a response from the Scottish Health and Sport Committee to the committee's request for information regarding our recent visit. Um, I'm asking if members are content to note their response. Right. And under correspondence, there are nine items of correspondence at page 152. Just a number for your attention. Page 165 is correspondence from Praxis Care Charity. Requesting a meeting with the committee to discuss cost pressures impacting on the voluntary sector, asking members if they are content to invite the charity to the next stakeholder event. Right. And page 167 is correspondence from the UK Home Care Association. Chair, can I, uh, Chair, just, yeah. I understand that um, the minister was to have a meeting. A lot of organisations in the voluntary sector uh, are, are experiencing such pressures, and I understand that the minister was to have a meeting with NICFA. And, and, and would it be possible potentially to invite NICPA either in some way to present as a, an umbrella group to the committee in a form or even a written submission to see where their collective view in all of this is? After the meeting with the, After the, meeting with the minister. Well, I, I think what I think we could do is. A lot of these and, yes, I think if we could seek a written response then from, from, from NICPA and then take it from there, that would be useful, yes. Um, page 175. 
sorry, the, the, the Home Care Association, um, looking for a meeting with the committee to discuss the implications of low cost paid for home care. Um, I'm asking members, are you content to invite them to the next stakeholder event? Yeah, great. And page 175 is correspondence from a member of the Youth Parliament um, seeking a meeting with a member of the committee to discuss the group's campaigns on mental health issue and the war on drugs. Um, just asking if any members available to meet with the group um, and if they're content also to invite representatives of the group to the next stakeholder mm -hmm. event. Great. Okay. Um, item on page 177 is correspondence from an individual it's in relation to hospital waiting times. Um, again, I'm asking members if they're content that we would write to the individual with details of their local MLAs. And page 178 is a request for information from an individual, again, asking if we're content that the individual is advised to write to the department for a response. Right. Are members then content to note the remaining correspondence? Right. Any other business? Date, time and place of next meeting is Wednesday the 24th of June at 2 o'clock in the Senate. There will be a pre-meeting at 1.30 in room 55, um, the education room across from the Senate. Thank you.